Hello, and welcome back to the New Discourses podcast. Welcome back to our mini-series here on the podcast, I guess tucked within the critical education domain, where we're exploring this weird UNESCO document about transforming higher education institutions so that they are remade specifically to meet the sustainable development goals of the United Nations Agenda 2030, which seems like something that repurposing all of our universities for isn't really what universities are supposed to be about. Now, I was calling this series The Strange Death of the University, and I wanted to really you know, remind you of that theme as we're going through. Why did I call it The Strange Death of the University? Kind of reflecting off of John Henry Newman, who I'm not going to um, kind of elaborate on in detail, who wrote this book, The Idea of a University, back in something like 1850-some-odd, 52 maybe, 1850-something. He explained that a university has to be a place where every field of study exists, because it is a universe T. Universe. So everything is there. A T. So it's a university, so every field of study must be there. And his case is, in fact, that theology needs to be there. And his case beyond that is, in fact, that theology not only needs to be there as a field of study, I guess this was during the secularization of the university that was going on through the 19th century. But theology doesn't just need to be there. It actually has a very special role to play. And what it does in particular is it takes all the other domains, whether the natural sciences, whether philosophy, whether the social sciences, whether the humanities, whether whatever, all the other domains, and it binds them and orients them toward a single conception of the good. And in fact, for him, being that it's a theology, and he's a, turns out, Catholic, but a monotheist, toward the one correct interpretation of the good. And so he warns in that, and we could say this is where he's warning, though he doesn't say this, uh, to my knowledge, it's been a bit since I've read the book, and to be fair, I didn't quite finish it, it's very, very long, Um he he makes the he doesn't quite say that this will be the death of the university, but that the death of the university is that the thing that the university is supposed to be, it is no longer. And while we can debate the idea that it's because theology was taken out of the university, as John Henry Newman posits in this book, would be the cause, it is doubtless that what's happened is a theology, a very purposed theology, has stepped in and has filled the void and has bound and oriented all of the disciplines of the university in a single direction. Now, I've given some podcasts in the past where I've talked about kind of the two big things, and we hear them all the time, say, especially in World Economic Forum documents, but we also hear them in United Nations documents, that the future is supposed to be sustainable and inclusive. And I've made the argument a few times that the new sensibility that Herbert Marcuse laid out in his second chapter of the Essay on Liberation that he wrote in 1969, that new sensibility is this combined idea of sustainability and inclusion. And in fact, inclusion is inside of sustainability. Sustainability is the bigger thing. If we have an inclusive society, that's socially sustainable. If we don't have an inclusive society, that's not socially sustainable. So inclusion actually fits within sustainability. But the goal is to create this sustainable and inclusive future, this sustainable society. And I call this the tyranny of the 21st century in a podcast on that subject. And I referenced documents like Marcuse. I'll remind you from the first episode in this series about this document from UNESCO that um, it opens by appealing to Marcuse. There's a foreword. Uh, a kind of a letter of introduction, and then there's a there's an initial introduction to the to the entire document that begins with literally saying we should go back to 1964 when Herbert Marcuse wrote One Dimensional Man and rethink what it's about. And so we're going through this document that's about transforming higher education institutions. I want to see if I can manage this without having to go all the way back up to the top because I've got my spot here. Uh, for the chapter two that we're going to investigate here. And it is, I think it is Knowledge Driven Actions Transforming Higher Education for Global Sustainability is the title of this horrendous document. And so anyway, 
Chapter 2 is Beyond Disciplinary Boundaries for the Sustainable Development Goals. So, disciplinary boundaries, the idea that biology does biology, chemistry does chemistry, and that they actually do different things. Or science does science, and the humanities do humanities, and they actually do different things. That is an impediment to achieving the sustainable development goals that are now going to, as I said, bind and orient the universities. They're going to, to, to kill off the university as a university and reimagine it as a, as a seminary, as a theological seminary for the broad neo-communist faith of sustainability kind of captured in these sustainable development goals. And if you recall from the beginning of this series, we actually saw that they explicitly say, and I think this is in both of the previous two episodes of this series, they explicitly say that universities and higher education institutions more broadly need to rewrite their mission statements to be satisfy and achieve the sustainable development goals. In this chapter, they're going to discuss the idea that disciplinary boundaries, the idea that different disciplines in the college do different things, is a problem. And I want to point out that this is a very theological move. Just like if we went back in time to, say, 50 years before John Henry Newman, so 1800-ish, and we look at what's going on in the theological seminaries at Yale, at Princeton, at Harvard, or wherever, Oxford, wherever, these university, these seminaries. What is the idea? Well, whatever the subject is, you're going to understand that through the theology of the Christian tradition. That's the idea. In other words, disciplinary boundaries dissolve within the theology. And that was sort of John Henry Newman's point. So there's a danger here that he points out that this actually dissolves disciplinary boundaries. But what we're seeing then is unambiguously a boomeranging of the purpose of the university, which began as a theological seminary, became secular, disciplinary, multidisciplinary, and then boomeranged back around and is now being repurposed again as a seminary. It is a theological move. We're going to erase disciplinary boundaries, and we're going to do so in a particular way. If you guessed, based on your readings or listenings to my work or my podcasts, that the way is Aufheben, or uh, sublation, you're probably right. But we're going to dissolve disciplinary boundaries so that all of the disciplines, whether the biology department, whether the chemistry department, whether the English department, whether the arts department, whether the music department, whether the education department, whether the engineering department, are all dedicated to the singular task of reorienting their missions in the direction of achieving the sustainable development goals of the United Nations let me hy- or highlight this one word, Agenda 2030. So, I don't remember there being a broad, civilization-wide discussion about whether or not the agenda of the United Nations with regard to achieving sustainable development goals by the year 2030 was a good idea. I don't recall participating in this. I just recall that this is a thing that's happening, and apparently we're all supposed to do it. And according to this document, all the universities are supposed to do it. And in this chapter, we're going to explore how specifically we're supposed to go beyond disciplinary boundaries. We're we're going to go into the transdisciplinary. Of course, it's trans, right? Transgender, transdisciplinary, transform our world, transmutate our spirits to the highest levels of the self-begotten. And what we're going to find is we're going to find that their goal is to go beyond disciplinary boundaries so that everything in the university is bound and oriented in the direction of the sustainable development goals. Chemistry can't just do chemistry because, holy shit, it might do something about fossil fuels. That wouldn't be acceptable. It might do petrochemistry. Biology can't do biology because it might actually do something that has anything else to do than like with windmills. This is kind of the point. And so the first section, 2.1, is the change to drive change. Just think about that. Like there's your your like dialectical doomsday wheel, right? We have to make changes so that we can make the changes that will drive change. In other words, we're going to put a transformation engine in the middle of what we're going on or what we're doing in the universities, what the universities exist to do. They'll rewrite their mission statements for this, remember. We are now facing, they tell us, the global challenge 
Doesn't that just make you, doesn't that feel so aspirational? Like we've got to rise up and meet this global challenge. Doesn't matter if it's made up. Doesn't matter if they believe it and it's not real. Doesn't matter if it's literally invented whole cloth. Doesn't matter if it's real. We have a global challenge. We are now facing the global challenge that is the survival of the human species on the planet. I suggest this person go and read Yoa Nuval Harari. Yuval Noah Harari. Whichever way it goes. Yuval Noah Harari. World Economic Forum, like mastermind guru, historian, goofball that wrote Sapiens, and more importantly, Homo Deus. That person hates the human species. It's obvious. Read, their, read, read his books. Hates the human species. Couldn't hate the human species more. But we have to worry about the survival of the human species by per the same agenda. Little paradoxical. Doesn't matter. We are now facing the global challenge that is the survival of the human species on the planet. While some argue, some argue, that there were also geological, ecological, and human changes in the remote past, this moment in time is distinct. Human beings, who to a large extent have provoked it, are still able to reverse current trends. Okay, so we've set the stage. This is a very dramatic moment. This is an inflection point in humanity. The whole world could end, but we could save it. We could be Bruce Willis and stop the meteor. And we have actually summoned the meteor, as it turns out, according to their analysis. To be able to achieve this goal, changes in the ways that knowledge is generated, circulated, and used are needed. But what kind of change? Probably self-serving for the regime, if I had to guess, just throwing that out. Among the most powerful tools for this are science and research. We are experiencing science and research. Science and research. Not scientific research. Science and research. That's suspicious. I can tell you right now the person who wrote this is not a scientist. Or not a good one anyway. We are experiencing paradigmatic changes that may not be widespread, but mark out the future and allow us to draw, draw up lines of action. The relationship of science and research with nature and with society has changed, together with the internal structures of many higher education institutions. This can be seen as a reaction to the growing insight that individual disciplinary developments alone cannot solve problems that require the understanding of multiple dimensions. This is starting to sound like Klaus Schwab. We have all these problems. The only way we can possibly solve them is through greater cooperation, greater coordination, centered with some kind of a you know, world brain or mastermind or council of stakeholders or something like that that will determine what the thing is. So you can't do chemistry qua chemistry anymore. You can't do biology qua biology anymore. You can't do philosophy qua philosophy anymore. That's not going to be acceptable. We have to put all of our heads together. We cannot solve our problems with individual disciplinary developments. Your basic research and your field isn't going to be enough. We need to empower transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approaches. In other words, we have to empower the goobers who think that they're good at that, who I promise you are not. People who are good at virtually nothing, but pretending that they're good at telling everybody in a lot of different departments what they're good at. This points to the need for epistemological and methodological changes in the ways knowledge is created. Uh-oh. Apparently, we're not creating knowledge right because it's not dedicated to solving the, the sustainable development goal problems. We have to do, we have to, we have to have other ways of knowing, it sounds like. The practices of scientific research are changing because, quote, the closer interaction of science and society signals the emergence of a new kind of science. Oh, a new science. Contextualized or context sensitive science. Context-sensitive science, contextualized science, you mean the kind of science that, say, bows to a Soviet? Maybe that kind. This is Lysenkoism, okay? If you don't know who Lysenko is, I don't have time to do this every time. You need to look up Trofim Lysenko, T-R-O-F-I-M, Lysenko, L-Y-S-E-N-K-O, Trofim Lysenko. He was the Soviet agriculturalist who had crackpot Soviet theories of genetics and agriculture that the Soviets in the USSR and then later China forced everybody to use, even though they were a disaster. Maybe between Russia, Ukraine, 
uh, broadly the Soviet Union, and then um, China, maybe 30, 40 million people starved as a result of this disaster. We're doing it in medicine. We're doing it in everything. We're going to make it every single subject coordinating in sustainable Lysenkoism. It's going to be a, a catastrophe. The question, they say, for science is no longer just what can we do, but what we want and how we can achieve it. This is the kind of this is starting to sound like the kind of shit that Voldemort or Lucifer would say. Among the central spaces for knowledge production are universities. However, today the need for change is reaching a new velocity. And the dialogue, but the need for change is reaching a new velocity. The need is getting faster. Or maybe slower, because a new velocity could be either one, technically. I'm telling you this a physicist didn't write this. We already know that. They wouldn't use the word velocity that way. The need for change is reaching a new velocity as the dialogue between higher education institutions and society has become more fluid and urgent. That's a sentence. As an expert, let me tell you, it doesn't mean a damn thing. The dialogue between universities and society has become more fluid and urgent. The dialogue between universities has become and society has become urgent. Bullshit. This is just made up. It's just trying to sound important. I'm sorry. More fluid? What does this dialogue between universities and society being more fluid mean? Does this mean that some jackass, I guess it means some jackass on Twitter is telling Jason Stanley at Yale how he has to think about things, and Jason Stanley then summarily tells him, I'm the greatest expert in the history of the world. I am the science, so I'm not going to listen to you. Is that more fluid? I, what do you mean? This is stupid. The question is how higher education institutions face new challenges and how they could be more pertinent and avant-garde and their fundamental contributions toward a sustainable society. So they have a goal. It's a sustainable society, but they have to be more pertinent. They can't do research that's not pertinent to achieving a sustainable society. See, that wouldn't be useful. So let's say that you study something to do with organic chemistry that has nothing to do with achieving a sustainable society. No, no, no. We're going to have to repurpose your work to achieve a sustainable society. See, you're going to have to be part of what the Soviet says you have to be a part of. You're going to be told what your research has to be. You don't get to do basic research anymore. You're going to have purposed research for the SDGs. And it has to be avant-garde. That's a word that, you know, goes with like postmodern philosophy. That's a word that goes with that edgy I, Joan thing that just came out, where apparently Joan of Arc is trans now or non-binary and Harry Potter looking girl pretending to be a guy with kind of beefy arms and armpit hair stands out there. And talks about how trans people are sacred. And then when everybody's like, holy shit, you guys told the whole story, they pull it down off of YouTube. That's avant-garde. So your organic chemistry is going to have to be avant-garde in the direction of achieving SDGs. Is that what you want? That's what the that's what United Nations or UNESCO, that's what the United Nations wants out of your organic chemistry classroom, your organic chemistry laboratory, your organic chemistry research. And I say organic chemistry just as a thing I've pulled out of the air. It could be basic mathematical combinatorial research. It could be, you know, something to do with biology. You could be some niche biologist like Colin Wright studying wasps and spiders. That's going to have to be geared in an avant-garde way toward achieving a sustainable society. Good luck getting a grant otherwise. Good luck getting published otherwise. Good luck not being part of the program that they're forcing you to be a part of. Good luck having any academic freedom. But remember, they told us there was increasing academic freedom to do this. Sustainability, they say, is a way of understanding life together, living with nature and the environment in a global world. That's communism. That's what Marx said. It's man figuring out how to live in and with nature and with each other in a way that's been fully humanized. Only, this is quoting somebody, I'm not sure who, uh, only by following an interdisciplinary approach. Sustainable development education will be able to confront problems across traditional disciplines, involve multiple stakeholders, and occur on multiple scales. See, this appeal to complexity means that they just want power. Such as climate change, poverty, and inequalities, acknowledging the interdependence between society and ecosystems. See, anytime you start appealing to, oh my god, it's so complex, we need cooperation and we need a managing body that just so happens to be made out of me, to manage it, what you're looking at is a power grab. This is classic. This is simple. This is something everybody needs to be aware of. Oh my God, it's so complicated. These things are so difficult. What we need to do is have this weird thing called multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, 
What you need is middle managers who can't do a single fucking job in the place. We're going to come in and pretend they can do all the jobs and tell everybody how to do all the jobs, even though they can't do anything. That's what those people are. We're the only ones who understand how complex it is. We're the only ones who understand how hard it is. We have to run everything, even though we don't know how to, literally, we don't know how to do anything. As a matter of fact, what we're going to hear is that humanities professors and social science professors are going to have to weigh in on the hard sciences. That's what they're actually going to make the point. And why? Because that's where all the fucking communists are. Are you paying attention? In that sense, sustainability is an objective that is transversal across disciplines, education, and professions. This is the most ridiculous document I've read in a long time at using a bunch of big words to say nothing. But that within that nothing is a completely totalitarian agenda that's branded to sound great, like sustainability. Who could argue against it? I'm going to argue against it because it is a totalitarian nightmare. However, it is not enough to understand this as merely aggregating discipline-based activities. More than the sum of these parts, I see you, I see you, alchemy, more than the sum of these parts, it is a way of creating knowledge and educating that is more than this. More than the sum of these parts? It really says this. This is, how, this is the stupidest document. More than the sum of these parts, it is a way of creating knowledge and educating that is more than this. More than this? It is more than this. That's the sentence. Such a call for change is not a criticism of the fundamental role disciplines can play in the processes of knowledge production and circulation. Rather, it's an attempt to better understand their achievements and limitations. The change consists of being efficient and effective in determining what the necessary forms of knowledge are in terms of certain objectives at this point in our collective history. Remember how the first episode of this was the red thread? They said transformation is the red thread that runs through all of the sustainable development goals. Well, here we go. Collective history. Change consists of being efficient and effective in determining what the necessary forms of knowledge are. So if you don't have a necessary form of knowledge, you know, remember when we had like people who are essential workers and non-essential workers and COOF? Now we're going to have essential knowledge and non-essential knowledge. Essential knowledge producing means and non-essential producing knowledge means. So that we can, and, and how are we going to define that? In terms of certain objectives, psst, they are the sustainable development goals. In terms of certain objectives at this particular point in our collective history. We're all apart. We're all in this together. <sighs> it's communism, guys. It's just communism. There's a need to reorient existing education. Did you? <laughs> there is a need to reorient existing education programs to include more aspects related to sustainability. What a shock. And its three pillars society, environment, and economy. Quote, no one discipline can claim education for sustainable development for its own, but all disciplines can contribute. UNESCO, 2005. Each according to his ability, each according to his need. <sighs> As academics, university authorities, and their agents, we consider critical thinking <clears throat> theory, to be one of the main values and most valuable elements of universities and higher education institutions. In addition to the more traditional functions of teaching and research, critical thinking is central to our dearest shared values, so we must think critically and reflect upon our mission and our role within society. Do you ever notice how often when the woke people broadly construed invoke the word think, the words think critically, they follow it with and reflect? Think critically and reflect. Think critically and reflect. Why? Well, what did Hegel say? Because that's how you do theory and practice together. You think, there's your theory, you put it into activity, there's your practice, it doesn't work because it's bullshit, and then you reflect through theory upon what you're looking at. It's speculative. Speculative, speculative doesn't mean that you're um, speculating like you're just sitting there thinking stuff up out of the air. It means looking in a mirror speculum. I know we all laugh, ha ha ha, because of gynecology today and all of that. It's a device that allows you to look somewhere. Speculum is the Latin for mirror. So you reflect. 
in a mirror that is constantly reflect, reflect, reflect. What that means is we're going to inform the what we're doing through theory. We have to reflect on what we're doing by reflecting it back through theory. We almost we must think critically and reflect. It's always that. They say that all the time. Go pick any of their documents and keyword search for the word reflect. See how often it comes up. All the time. Weirdly often. Because it's the same thing as Hegel. So it's, it's continuous. 1807, Phenomenology of Spirit, continuous to 2022 UNESCO document about transforming everything using Hegelian methods, as it turns out. We insist that this mission is not linear. Uh-oh. You throw out the linearity. That's not good. That means they're going to defer to complexity. It's going to be really complex, so we need specialists to figure it out. We insist that this mission is not linear, that it must move beyond traditional separations between basic and applied knowledge, and that it integrates both thinking about problems and working together toward their solutions. Theory and practice. How about that? Hmm. In the academic literature, these new forms of knowledge creation have different nomenclatures and definitions. They're the subjects of internal polemics among, because, yeah, the actual academics are pissed that these idiots are taking over. Why? Among the most frequently used concepts of those are of those of multi, inter, and transdisciplinarity. That's so many syllables. Multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and transdisciplinarity. See box number one. Should we skip to box number one or finish the paragraph? Let's finish the paragraph and we'll go to box number one talking about these three ideas. This is really the key takeaway from this chapter that I really want to talk to you about, so we're going to have to do that. However, precisely because this process includes not only academics, but all members of society, we choose to talk about different forms of, quote, working together. You mean uh, communist cooperation. Got you. Box one, multi-enter and transdisciplinarity. This actually takes up the majority of the next page, but not quite all of it. As recognition has dawned that single disciplines working in isolation will not be able to address complex planetary and societal challenges, Recognition has dawned. In the passive tense, recognition just kind of woke up. Complex. Did you contribute to that recognition? No, you just got told about it. In other words, this is BS. This is people have decided that they can gain power over everybody else in the university and society this way, so they have had a recognition dawn upon them. And the dawning is that we have to blend all of our disciplines together under the auspices of political officers who are the masterminds of how it works under interdisciplinary dorks who actually are not collaborating through multiple disciplines or multiple real disciplines, they're collaborating through multiple fake disciplines, like autoethnography, which is a combination of ethnography, which is, I guess, a form of anthropology, sort of, sometimes, depends, and then writing a diary. Okay, a number of key terms, multidisciplinary, maybe I skipped something, I did skip something. Let's start that part again. As recognition has dawned that, a sing uh, that single disciplines working in isolation will not be able to address complex planetary and societal challenges. I don't know why they think that, but they've decided that. Diverse practices of, quote, beyond discipline collaboration have evolved. Let me back up to the Soviet point here again. See, what they're saying is people can't go do their own research and then have people who manage things that work above them figure out how to, you know, like a research lab director or whatever, figure out how to use that research to do something in the world which is literally how we've solved problems for a couple hundred years. What you actually need is you need people who are experts who are going to make sure that all the expert, all the work gets directed in certain ways that are beyond a discipline and they're based in collaboration, right? So the idea is that you now need special, the normal, the normal idea of like a lab manager is not good enough. You're going to have to have somebody who is, um, skilled in deriving that which is useful and directing the research going on underneath them into that which is useful. And the normal normal forms of management won't work. We need a new form. This is the point I wanted to make. We need new forms of management. The new forms of management are going to be the Soviet, the council that directs how it works. That's what this is. That's how the power grab works. See, we already have all these independent disciplines, single disciplines working in isolation, and then people are gathering information from these different disciplines that work in different places to do things and solve problems in the world that's already happening. It's been happening very successfully for a long time. Corporations, for example, or even government entities like scary DARPA exist to take lots of basic research, some of which is happening in-house, lots of which is happening outside of house, to combine that and to do something useful with it. This already happens. What they're saying is, no, 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 we have to put this under different management, specifically our management. 
It doesn't work though. You see, they, they pretend that it's all separate and dis disparate and useless. No, no, no. We need to put it under new management that's our management that's explicit, that's literally a Soviet. That's what they're actually keying toward. That's how you can tell this is communism, but you can't exactly pick that up without being able to read between the lines of what they're writing. Now, carrying on a number of key terms, these are bullshit terms. You can tell because of how many, how many syllables they have. Multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary have been used to describe the varying degrees of interaction and, int and integration involved in these practices, but there remains some ambiguity surrounding how these terms are used and understood. Guess what? The only real one that they like is trans. In this report, we do not aim to provide clear-cut definitions because they're bullshit artists, but it is important to clarify our own understanding of these terms and, importantly, their differences. We distinguish the terms having regard to the degrees of integration, the distribution of power among different actors, there's your critical thinking and reflection, and the rationale for collaboration. So this is why they're saying that we're not going to be able to use existing forms of management. We're going to have to create a new form of management that's under our control. In other words, a Soviet. That's, this is Soviet logic. I don't mean Soviet like Soviet Union specifically. I mean Soviet as in there will be a council of experts and the council of experts will decide how things go. It's, tech, it's technocracy. Multidisciplinarity brings together knowledge from different disciplines to address a given issue. The process of knowledge production and power relations between disciplines is mostly left unaffected in multidisciplinary collaboration. So that's not going to be acceptable. Each discipline works in a self-contained manner without aiming to transform the disciplines themselves. Hmm. Yeah, so chemistry can do chemistry, and physics can do physics, and biology can do biology, and humanities can do humanities. And then maybe somebody figures out ways to draw off of these to do a, something. Compared to inter- and transdisciplinary collaboration, integration, both on an epistemic and social level, is not an objective of multidisciplinarity. So just getting a bunch of multidisciplinary views together and thinking about problems or doing something, not going to be not going to be sufficient. What I was just describing, not going to be sufficient. It's going to have to go into the trans land where they have all the power. Interdisciplinarity describes a mode of knowledge production that focuses on coordination and interaction between different disciplines as a means to both advance knowledge and action. In contrast to multidisciplinarity, there is an attempt to integrate scientific practices including information, data, concepts, and theories from more than one discipline. However, the term has been used to describe a range of ambitions from cooperation that leaves disciplinary boundaries mostly untouched to collaborative work through which disciplines themselves are transformed. So that's a little better in their view because there's some transformation going on. But listen, this is a made up word. Interdisciplinarity is a made up word that means collaborating. Multidisciplinarity is a made up word that means having different kinds of perspectives available. Transdisciplinarity is the third one. Transdisciplinarity was introduced as a made up word. Wait, it doesn't say that. Sorry. Transdisciplinarity was introduced as an explicit addition to interdisciplinarity to describe collaborations that go beyond coordinating interactions between different disciplines and aim at transcending them. Oh, shit. Therefore, moving beyond disciplinary boundaries. In addition, transdisciplinarity rests on the premise. So, what does transcending them mean? That means that physics isn't physics anymore. Chemistry isn't chemistry anymore. Biology isn't biology anymore. Arts aren't arts anymore. English isn't English anymore. Engineering isn't engineering anymore. What that means is we're going to coordinate interactions between them in order to alfhaven, to sublate, to transcend them, to understand them on a higher plane that mixes and matches and works like a cafeteria from them, but also directs them in a particular direction. Thereby, moving beyond disciplinary boundaries. In addition, transdisciplinarity rests, they're going to transform the disciplines into something that's serving a particular goal, which is, in this case, the sustainable development goals. They're going to transform the different disciplines to be tools for achieving the SDGs. In addition, transdisciplinarity rests on the premise that researchers alone cannot solve these problems because you're going to need a Soviet and that therefore academic boundaries also need to be transgressed through the incorporation of extra academic actors, <laughs> like commissars, I guess, and knowledge into processes of problem definition, knowledge production, and knowledge use. 
In other words, Klaus Schwab has to direct what the fuck you're going to do in your research. Transdisciplinary collaborations thus aim for both conceptual integration of different disciplines, conceptual integration of dis different disciplines, you know, like bringing the humanities into the sciences or bringing the social sciences into the sciences so that they can start to work those levers to transform those disciplines into something useful to the regime. Where was I? They aim for both conceptual integration of different disciplines and the transgression of academic boundaries, which is not necessarily a part of interdisciplinary modes of producing knowledge, to include other forms of knowledge. Say, I told you, other ways of knowing, other knowledges. Transdisciplinarity points to a disintegration of boundaries and the development of something entirely different. This is literally what Alan Sokol hoaxed social text in 1995 and 6 over. They were transgressing the boundaries. In fact, that's literally the title of his hoax papers, transgressing the boundaries. And he was misusing concepts out of quantum gravity, out of physics. He was misusing concepts out of physics and mathematics to make social theory points. It's literally the hoax paper that put egg all over their faces and in the 90s led to the, 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 the final, the end of the science wars, which we all mistakenly believed we won. But these rats did not stop chewing on the wires and now they're attempting to electrocute us all or themselves and burn the house down. Transdisciplinarity points to a disintegration of boundaries and the development of something entirely different. Yeah, it's called Soviet bullshit. In highlighting commonality in the rationale for applying one of these approaches, a recent review of inter- and transdisciplinary research shows that despite the crucial differences, there are also commonalities. For example, the focus on problem-solving and interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. What a waste of words. Just a flat waste of words. So now we come back to finish what the section says. The section of the this section of the report responds to the first of the core themes laid out in the introduction. The role of inter- and transdisciplinarity for curriculum development and research programs, emphasizing especially the relationship between the humanities and the social sciences on the one hand and the natural sciences on the other. I'm telling you, all this is about is bringing communism into the sciences. That's all it's about. The entire purpose of this is Lysenkoism. It first develops the idea of working together across disciplines, and then second, what it's going to do is take control and twist you into doing what they say or ruining your life. Wait, but it doesn't say that. It first develops the idea of working together across disciplines and beyond academic boundaries to achieve the sustainable, de sustainable development goals. The first thing it does is twist across disciplines and beyond academic boundaries for a purpose. All of your work in every academic department is going to be directed to the purpose of achieving the sustainable development goals. Pointing to the rationales for emphasizing novel ways of collaboration and their potential impacts, building on that, this chapter will lay out some of the core challenges and structural barriers to thinking and working together in both research and education. Finally, some ways forward are outlined, drawing on a range of exemplars and practical illustrations of promising work that is already underway in higher education institutions all around the world. So now we understand what's happening here, right? You understand what's happening. Everything in the university is going to be redirected in the direction of collaborating universally to achieve the sustainable development goals, everything else is going to get shut down, and they're going to bring communists out of the humanities and social sciences into the natural sciences in order to repurpose them to work in that direction. They're going to call it working together the whole way through. Novel ways of collaboration. Yeah, a Soviet. So this is the death of the university. This is why this series is called The Strange Death of the University, to bring it back up. What the university was shall no longer be. It has or is dying. It doesn't have to. It could stop this. It won't, but it could. The university is dying. It is being replaced as with, with, with a completely Soviet think tank in the direction of neo-communist sustainability, whether you like it or not. And if you're a researcher or a worker in one, you'd better get your act together. Why? Section 2.2, .2, working together for the sustainable development goals. 2.2.1, why is this necessary? <sighs> Without a doubt, the complexity of sustainability, again that appeal to complexity. The complexity of sustainability challenges and the interconnected nature of the sustainable development goals means that thinking and working together, collaborating for brevity, is essential if challenges are to be overcome and goals 
Matt. Might as well quote or uh, uh, cite Klaus Schwab on this, but it doesn't. This will require both specialized insights and collaboratively generated knowledge across traditional disciplinary brown, uh, disciplinary boundaries. More than this, collaboration partners must be willing and able to overcome prevailing assumptions about the relative value of contributions from different disciplines and challenge incumbent forms of power and privilege that run counter to the sustainable development goals. So that's a, there's a lot that just happened. A whole lot just happened in that sentence. Okay, let's break it down because there's two major parts. Collaboration partners must be willing and able to overcome prevailing assumptions about the relative value of contributions from different disciplines. So we get this right on the heels of them saying that the goal is, on the one hand, the humanities and social sciences are going to have to be integrated into, on the other hand, the natural sciences. Now, I don't know if you spent much time in university, but I can tell you that there's kind of a pecking order and there's a little bit of joking and jovial, you know, inter disciplinary, um, you know, elbow rubbing or ribbing, I guess, uh, with one another about which, which disciplines are kind of the most respectable. The mathematicians look down on the physicists, the physicists look down on the mathematicians. You know, we think as mathematicians saying the we, we look at the physicists and we think, ha ha ha, you silly physicists, you're not very good at math. And the math, uh, the physicists look at the mathematicians and say, ha ha ha, you stupid mathematicians, you don't do anything real. And there's all this kind of joking, oh, biology, that's so squishy you know, chemistry or whatever is physics that doesn't want to get its pants on or whatever. We have all these different kinds of jokes. And, but there's this kind of a general pecking order that somewhere everybody kind of accepts that, you know, you've got this kind of like something super elite going on in math and physics and then there's chemistry and some of those harder sciences and engineering maybe. And then biology gets a little squishier and then you get into the medicine and then you get and sooner or later you're in the social sciences and then eventually you're in the humanities and the arts and then you're off to lunch somewhere else, and it's getting less and less rigorous. And there are all these jokes about this. Everybody kind of knows this. Okay, that has to be overcome. Collaboration partners must be willing and able to overcome prevailing assumptions about the relative value of contributions from different disciplines. Why? Because the natural science people are going to say, what are these fucking English majors doing here? Why is there an English professor trying to tell me what my physics means that they can't even read? Their value isn't, their contribution isn't valuable. You're going to have to overcome that. You, the physicist, are going to have to start listening. They're going to force the humanities and social science into your discipline, and you're going to have to start listening to them. And you're not going to be able to devalue their contributions. doesn't matter that they can't do math on a third grade level, and that literally everything you do is based on having an extraordinary grasp of mathematics. doesn't matter. The relative contributions are equal. We're in a communist university now. So that's number one. What it means is, you guys in the natural sciences and engineering are going to have to take it when the humanities and social sciences come in with their stupid fucking social theory and tell you that your science is wrong because their criticality, their critical theory dimension says something about what you're doing, causing some kind of a problem. That's what that means. That's what that means. That's very important. They are also, they must also be willing and able, okay? Collaboration partners must be willing and able to challenge incumbent forms of power and privilege that run counter to the sustainable development goals. So if there's any kind of power and privilege that exists within either society, the university, the department, these collaboration groups, anything, power and privilege, if it runs counter to the sustainable development goals, you're going to have to overcome that. You're going to have to, in fact, challenge it. You're going to have to fight against it. You can't just do your physics anymore. You're going to have to be a political activist in, um, in pursuit of overcoming any so-called power and privilege that these humanities majors or humanities professors and English professors and social science professors, professors identify. The queer theorists are going to come in and tell you about how your chemistry isn't gay enough. I'm not kidding. That's not queer enough. They don't like gays anymore. Oh, it's not queer enough. They're going to come in and tell you, oh, your, your chemistry is not queer enough. And you are going to have to stop doing your chemistry to work to overcome the incumbent forms of power and privilege because that would run counter to the sustainable development goals of equity. Given the challenges inherent in such collaborative endeavors and the diversity of roles and remits that higher education institutions hold within specific contexts, it is likely to be those higher education institutions that are able to commit time and resources to collaborative activities that will be able to advance interdisciplinary thinking and doing 
for the 2030 Agenda and support cross-sectoral implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. So what they're saying is this isn't this is going to be hard and most schools aren't going to have the resources. So the good schools, the ones that really matter, are going to be able to commit time and resources. They're going to hire commissars. They're going to hire coordinators. They're going to hire more and more of these people to facilitate these bullshit projects. They're going to hire sustainable development officers, etc., to make sure this can all go. They're going to have to take time away from the things you're already doing in the in the university, your teaching, your research, etc., your actual chemistry job, your actual physics job, your actual mathematics duties, to dedicate time and resources to sustainable development goals. That's what will define a good university versus a crappy university in their new paradigm. Strange death of the university, indeed. Within higher education institutions, discussions around abound. Discussions abound regarding the best way to activate collaboration for sustainability. If they do, get some rope and hang me now. Oh my God, I don't even want to con contemplate the fact that these discussions already abound. What are you doing? What are you doing, higher education institutions? What are you doing, universities? What are you doing, professor? Do you not have some real work to do? You're having discussions abound? I don't believe this, by the way. I believe this happens in these administrative offices filled with commissars and probably in the fucking humanities department that's going to get forced into everything else because they don't have anything better to do. Because their theories are bullshit. You can learn the whole thing in 20 minutes. It's just a matter of learning how to stick arity on the end of every other word. Ality, arity. Pretend you know what you're talking about. Use 14 syllable words that don't mean anything. Write complicated sentences that aggrandize yourself and that cry about gay people somewhere. And that's literally all you freaking do. You literally can learn the entire discipline in 15 minutes. And then you brainwash kids and you read shit you shouldn't be reading because it's worthless garbage. And you write shit that's even worse. And then that's all you do. That's literally all you do. So you have nothing better to do. So you're, you have discussions that abound regarding the best way to activate collaboration, to make activists, for, to, to torque other people in the university that actually have better things to do, legitimately better things to do, and to co activate collaboration for sustainability. Oh, God, I hate activists. If you're an activist in the university, if you're in the professors of the administrative ranks in a university and you're an activist, you have no business being there, quit. You have no business being there. Jeez, come on. These are often allied to broader debates about the future. Discussions abound that are allied to other discussions. Allied to discussions now? These are often allied to broader debates about the future form and function of higher education institutions. See, these are activists that just want to transform the institution to achieve activist goals. So you're over there pecking away at your math proofs, at your physics problem, trying to figure out what in the hell is going on inside of a black hole with the gravity or whatever you're doing. Something hard, something useful. You're trying to figure out some kind of engineering problem in order to build some kind of a new material that can actually achieve something complicated and valuable in the world. You're really working on this. This is what you're doing. You're working on something hard and valuable. These dorks over, these bored activists who have nothing better to do, but you're going to have to remember, you're going to have to value their contributions in the humanities departments and social sciences departments who are activists pretending to be professors. They're having important debates about how they can transform the university to be something completely different where what you do is not acceptable if you actually do real interesting work. The strange death of the university. Okay. The future form and function of HEIs, higher education institutions, with calls for a shift away from the era of specialization typified by universities in the 20th century toward the creation of a more interdisciplinary space. However, rather than a linear shift from one state to another, Mazoki, 2019, maintains that dual trends within the university sector are discernible with evidence of increasing specialization and working across disciplinary boundaries operating in parallel. As shown in box one, that's what we discussed before, there are some established terms for articulating different forms of collaborative activity, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary, which involve different actors and embody different power relations between them. Different power relationships between them. That's because this is communism, guys. According to Vieni Baptista et al., 2019, in addition to the generic desire to improve understanding of systems, the generic desire to improve understanding of systems. That's probably Marxist. 
Collaboration across disciplines also has philosophical, instrumental, and critical drivers. So philosophical reason, instrumental reason, that's actually solving problems, by the way, and critical theory, which can lead to the radical which can lead to the radical system change required to achieve the sustainable development goals. So here they're telling you that it's not going to be possible to achieve the sustainable development goals unless we radically change the entire purpose of universities. And that means everybody in the universities. That means you. If you're in a university and you like what you do, generally speaking, not necessarily in the current political environment, say you're a chemist and you like doing chemistry, or you're an astronomer and you like doing astronomy, or you're an engineer and you like doing engineering, you're a biologist and you like doing biology, you better speak up. You better fight because all you're going to do is get your stuff tooled to the purposes of this activist agenda. That's what's happening here. From a philosophical perspective, there is a desire to transcend the narrowness that a single discipline perspective can generate. Yeah, don't dig and dig and dig on your specific domain within your field and try to dig out all the knowledge and understand it. That narrowness isn't going to be acceptable. An instrumental justification, did I get this right? Yeah, okay, an instrumental justification for collaborative activity focuses on the need to solve existing societal challenges that are embedded in complex adaptive systems while a critical argument for collaboration seeks to challenge underlying assumptions and power dynamics in existing systems of knowledge production. That's what I told you. This is critical theory. This is Marxism. This is a communist transformation of your job if you work in a university. If you like what you're doing, you better stop sleeping. You better stop tooling around with these fools. You better fight. You will not be doing it in two years. Your job is going to turn into an activist nightmare. Now, if I know a little bit about working in a university, and I have people I know well who work in universities today, and all I know from everything I experienced and have been told is that your list of duties and, and responsibilities just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So you know what these exploitative monsters are going to do to you. You're going to have to figure out how to keep doing everything you're doing at the level you're doing it and make time for this interdisciplinary crap. You're going to have to set aside. Somehow, I know your schedule's full. I know you're working 80 hours a week. I know you're barely sleeping. I know you work all the damn time, especially if you're tenure track. I know you're grading, you're teaching, you're researching, you're trying to keep up with a million things. You're on a committee. I know. I understand. And they're going to tell you that you're going to put 20 to 25 hours a week into this activism or else. They're going to tell you this. I'm telling you. Interdisciplinary meetings. Meeting after meeting, training after training, they're going to waste your time. If They're going to make you crazy, and if you can't hack it by being a fake who becomes an activist and skates through the system and doesn't do any real effective work, if you actually care about what you do, you're going to get squeezed out. You have to understand what's happening. They're Sovietizing in the name of sustainability. We can call it neo-Soviet or new Soviet, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. That's what they're doing. The pressures on you are about to go through the roof if you work in a university. They're going to go so high. You're already squeezed for time. You're already crushed for time. You're already probably a disaster for time. And they're going to demand that you set aside not some, but a lot of time to these trainings, to these meetings, to interdisciplinary crap that doesn't get anything done, and that you were wrong in the first place for thinking that your research should have been the priority because that's narrow specialization that's not even good under instrumental reason that they've now repurposed to their purposes. If you love what you do, you better fight back. It's not going to last. You have made a deal with the devil so far by remaining and not fighting. The checks come and due. 2.2.2. What is the impact of collaborating for the SDGs? Certainly, research has found that greater accountability and ethical oversight can be generated in collaborative settings. I'm sure. Greater accountability and ethical oversight. In other words, there's going to be more bureaucracy making you do these things. More bureaucratic crap to waste your time, like I just said. With indications that innovative innovation capacity can also be elevated. See, you're going to waste your time with all this administrative bureaucracy crap, having to do shit you don't want to do, doing activist shit for the humanities departments telling you what to do and meanwhile somehow that's going to indicate that's somehow going to increase your innovative capacity as well how by quote 
better understanding societal needs, and more thoroughgoing efforts to transform research practice problems and relationships. Such BS. There are, however, certain cr criteria to be met for collaborative activity to function optimally, and higher education institutions vary in terms of their histories, cultures, and socioeconomic mandates. As a result, there needs to be acceptance of and respect for different theories, methods, and forms of knowledge that diverse disciplines identify, create, and utilize, and for collaboration that ensures equal participation and contribution between actors. That's a huge sentence, and let me just make it real clear for you. All it's saying is, you over there in the physics department, nobody's going to listen to you. You're going to listen to the English department. You're going to listen to the social sciences department. You're going to listen to the queer theorist. That's what that means. We already all know how the pecking order works. What they're saying is the pecking order has to go. We're going to get interdisciplinary. We're, in fact, going to get transdisciplinary and transcend your discipline to do something with it that mixes all the disciplines together and sublates them to a higher level, Alfhaven, which is going to abolish but keep your discipline and repurpose it to a higher purpose. That's what Alfhaven literally means. But there's going, you are going, if you're a physicist or a mathematician or a chemist or a biologist, you are going to allow for the acceptance of and respect for different theories, methods, and forms of knowledge. From what? From diverse disciplines like the African American Studies Department, the Queer Theory Department, the English Department, the Feminist Department. This is Lysenkoism. If you were a biologist or an agriculturalist in the Soviet Union, you would be told that you need to have acceptance of and respect for different theories and methods and forms of knowledge from diverse views of agriculture and biology. In particular, what you need to do is avoid the bourgeois ones, which is what you're going to be told. You can't take on white science. You can't take on masculine science. You can't take on unsustainable science like, like uh, fossil fuels or petrochemistry or any of this kind of thing. I assume petrochemistry means oil and gas and all of this and not rocks, but I apologize if I've got that wrong. I turns out I don't know everything. Um, that's what that means. And then you're going to have to <laughs> uh, identify, create, and utilize uh, collaboration that ensures equal participation and contribution between the actors, where they get to assume that you're already overvalued and that they're undervalued. That's how this, this is how inclusion works every time. This isn't new. This isn't 2020 where everybody's shocked this is happening. This important issue is covered in depth in Chapter 3. Oh, that's a doozy. Flagging the unequal patterns of power and privilege be between and beyond disciplines. In other words, that's the chapter that's all about other ways of knowing, by the way. That's the one that says that the traditional ways of knowing, especially in the natural sciences, aren't acceptable because they don't have an element of critical theory philosophy worked in from these other departments I keep naming. You might think at this point that I'm exaggerating. I assure you I'm not. I'm understating the problem. You need to recognize what's happening around you. And if you were waiting for the moment to fight, the moment for the last stand, you're hearing it. This document marks it. The university is going to die. I'm okay with that, frankly. I don't have any ambition to save the damn thing anymore. None. But you might. And if you do, you might want to get active on it. Because they're going to kill it. They're going to turn it into an activist think tank for achieving a particular agenda that you never actually agreed to. The United Nations declared it. Some idiot politician said, yeah, okay, we'll do that. And then we're all stuck with this crap. We all know it's a disaster in the making. Chapter three, when we get to that, that'll be the next one in the series, is all about these unequal patterns of power and privilege in knowledge formation. It is all about other ways of knowing. It is the feminist glaciology paper that got me started in some sense in all of this mess come to life. Where, for example, in that paper, they say for glaciology, the study of glaciers, scientific study of glaciers, to be considered a legitimate science, has any hope of taking on climate change, that they have to do things like incorporate feminist art projects. For example, one of the things they talk about in the paper, I'm not exaggerating, this is really there, in the so-called feminist glaciology paper, is that they say that there's, you know, there's satellite photos of glaciers on tops of mountains and, you know, in the ocean and in the Arctic. There's satellite photos of, of these things. And I, you're like, glaciers in the ocean. And I mean at the edge of the Arctic, stupid. So there's these satellite photos. So you can see how they recede and how they advance. And you can see how they spread and how they melt and how they do all the different things that they do. There's satellite photos of the real things. And glaciologists can study those to figure out what the conditions in the ice are and what's happening. 
And they say, well, there's a feminist, no kidding, who paints pictures of that type. And scientists don't even use her paintings. They have to incorporate it or science is sexist. This is what we're headed toward. If you don't fight, you deserve it. You deserve every bit of it. And I am going to laugh. I'm going to sit back here and laugh. They're gonna, the story is going to come out. It's going to be in the post-millennial or it's going to be on the internet. And I'm going to share it with LOL. That's all I'm going to say because ha ha ha, fuck you. You didn't fight. Ha ha ha, you were warned. It's coming. I hope you enjoy it. Actually, I really hope you fight and stop it, but I hope you enjoy it. That's what it's going to look like. Prejudice and misconceptions among both researchers and policymakers can work against greater diversity of disciplines and collaborative research. Huh. And teaching initiatives. Yeah, here's my thought on that. Keep your feminism out of glaciology. Keep your queer theory out of chemistry. Keep your indigenous studies out of mathematics. Keep your English, whatever the fuck you do over there, out of all of it. Out of all of the hard sciences. Keep all activism out of engineering. No Lysenkoism. That's what I think. I think this idea that, you know, prejudice and misconceptions, like that English is not the same, that, that it, most English people can't do math. Is that a misconception? No. But they think that math's not important. It's just one way of knowing. Among both researchers and policymakers can work against greater diversity of disciplines and collaborative research and teaching and issues. I don't want greater diversity. I don't want your feminism in the sciences. I don't want it there. I don't want that diversity in there. Get out. Shut up. You're playing a game where you mean bad ideas, diversity of bad ideas being mixed into not bad ideas. That's what you mean. But you're pretending that it means, oh, well, women and black people might not be able to be a scientist anymore. Screw you. That's a lie. We're sick of the lie. We're not participating in the lie anymore. Screw you. Keep your stupid feminism out of the sciences. Perfectly acceptable to exclude that because it's not science. What's their example? For example, they say, Research in Europe has indicated that the arts, humanities, and social sciences need to be involved more deeply in collaborative activities within higher education institutions. See, the arts, humanities, and social sciences need to have more power. They've given this the acronym of AHSS, which I don't recognize as a real acronym. The European Federation of, Ac of Academies of Sciences and Humanities also found that a technocratic and instrumental attitude towards societal challenges reflected in the language of Horizon 2020 funding calls within Europe has discouraged greater involvement from AHSS researchers. Hey, we have this project. We need people who know what the hell they're doing. Hey, arts people, we're not giving you money. That's the problem that they're identifying here. So radical interdisciplinarity. Not just interdisciplinarity, radical disciplinarity, interdisciplinarity as collaborative work involving AHSS, arts, humanities, and social sciences, and other disciplines is sometimes called, requires going beyond a problem-solving approach to achieving the SDGs, to incorporate critical and even transgressive approaches and motives. I'm telling you, your discipline's going to die. It's going to die. You're going to let it die because you're too stupid to fight. You're too stupid to know what's going on. You're too stupid to fight. You think you're so smart. You're a physicist. You're an astronomer. You're a chemist. You're a mathematician. You think you're so fucking smart. You don't even know what's happening around you. Your discipline's going to die. And you're going to let it die because you're too stupid to know what's actually happening beyond the piece of paper in front of you. Maybe you should read this piece of paper a few times and see what it says. Radical interdisciplinarity may include challenging current narratives or bringing historical or contextual perspectives to bear on present conditions. There it is. Challenging current narratives, like physics doesn't need feminism included in it, or glaciology doesn't need feminism in it, or mathematics doesn't need to be turned into some social science where 2 plus 2 can equal 5 sometimes. That's a current narrative. We have to challenge those. Or bringing historical or contextual perspectives, like culturally relevant teaching. Or historical. That's the Marxist word, by the way. That's how historical conditions have shaped your field up to this point so that it excludes women. This is Marxism. Essentially, it is argued that opening up challenges presented by the Sustainable Development Goals to interrogation and critique and allowing them to be approached from novel angles has a potential to widen participation and the degree of innovation of the resulting responses, like bringing you got to open up and let feminism into your glaciology. 
Such engagement of diverse disciplines needs to be embedded within higher education institution systems. It needs to be embedded. Why in the world do you need feminism and glaciology, by the way? You don't. Feminism doesn't help glaciology. It helps feminists get scientific-sounding publications. And then those activist feminists can go use the, those publications to claim that they know some shit they don't know, usurp authority that they don't have, and then go out and push activist agendas on people who might actually believe that they have a good idea behind them instead of just being a crackpot activist. That's why. The point is to bring crackpot activists into positions of authority, both over you and with the broader public, and with, say, um, legislators, lawyers, etc., who do things in the world. And it needs to be embedded with higher education institution systems, as they say. It needs to take place across research and teaching life cycles, from program design to impact evaluation. So you're going to have to have a feminist decide that your project, or a queer theorist, or a whatever, it doesn't matter, an activist, a Soviet activist, is going to decide whether or not your research design, the program design, the impact evaluation, the whole thing whether it meets their agendas, including the sustainable development goals and the parts of those that they are dedicated to, like complete gender equality or whatever nonsense that they've repurposed into gender equity, into their thing, like climate justice, etc. Such arguments for widening disciplinary participation in collaborative research and teaching have been made before, however, with limited impact. Yeah, because they don't work. That's literally stupid. In the following subsection, reasons why diversification have not occur, has not occurred are examined in detail. Two point, they're, they're, I bet they don't just say because it's stupid. It's a terrible idea. It shouldn't happen. It's Sovietization. It is Lysenkoism. They don't mention those things. 2.2.3, moving from agreement to action. See, you didn't even think about this yet, but we're moving from agreement, which you didn't give yet, but I guess you did because you're still reading it, to action. Now you're going to be committed to doing stuff. They just kept going. They didn't give you a time for debate. They're just going. While there is general agreement about the need for thinking and working together for the SDGs within the HEI sector, is there? They just declared that. They literally just declared, while there is general agreement about the need for thinking and working together for the sustainable development goals of Agenda 2030 for the United Nations across higher education institutions. This is not true. There is less agreement about how that collaborative activity could and should take place. These people are in their bubble, and their bubble is going to extend to you if you don't say, wait a minute, no, I don't have general agreement with this crap. I don't have general agreement that the university should die and become a sustainable development goal think tank and activist center. I think it should be doing something that universities do, not becoming an arm of your agenda. Maybe you should stand up and start saying that kind of stuff. In addition, there is a gamut of context-specific challenges to overcome, both profound and mundane. Even if agreement can be secured, the action should be taken. Undoubtedly, responding to these challenges will require substantive change. Additional time, resources, and investment will be required as will a cultural change in mindsets in academia and beyond. I thought there was general agreement, and now we're going to have to have a change in mindsets in order to be able to do it? Hmm. And, open, and an open dialogue between participants. An open dialogue means you're going to shut up and you're going to listen, or else you're having fragility. You are not going to be allowed to disagree because then it's not an open dialogue. You're shutting them down using narratives of position and power. This is communism. There is also space for higher education institutions to play a significant role in extending collaborative partnerships with each other and with other stakeholders that are engaged in, sorry, you have to scroll, the 2030 agenda, including governments and communities. The nature and value of partnerships beyond higher education institutions are addressed explicitly in chapter four of this report, which I'm not totally sure we're going to bother with, by the way, in this series. You can read it for yourself, maybe as homework. As relations with partner, within partnerships can take a variety of forms, from unequal partnerships where one partner occupies a subordinate role, to symmetric, symmetrical sorry, collaborations, to mutually challenging relationships committed to more radical shifts in knowledge production practices through such collaboration. What that means is that you are going to have to have uh, excuse me, partnerships 
We can't have unequal ones where one partner of the English department occupies a subordinate role in a technical discussion. No, 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 that won't be okay. We can't even have symmetrical collaborations. We have to have mutually challenging relationships. Guess what? If you have power and privilege, you don't get to challenge people. If you're in a science, a hard science, you have power and privilege in the university. You don't get to challenge the AHSS, the arts, humanities, and social sciences. You are not going to get to. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You will not get to challenge them. But they will challenge you so that they so that you can become committed to more radical shifts in knowledge production practices through such collaboration. This is feminism and glaciology. I'm telling you, that's what it is. Before exploring the importance of equal partnerships, it is important to outline the range of challenges that can occur when expanding collaborative thinking and doing by HEI's theory and praxis in relation to achieving the sustainable development goals. Underpinning this challenge matrix is the recognition that universities and more generally higher education institutions operate in different contexts and are diverse in size and structure, focus and resourcing. In addition, while the specific challenges of research and teaching are considered separately in the next section, these activities often interact. Okay. It's interesting for me to read this because a number of years ago, you you will know that four years ago, as a matter of fact, this week, as I record this, uh, the Grievance Studies Affair was released. And one of our fake papers was about feminist astronomy paralleling, very closely paralleling the feminist ge- uh, glaciology paper. And we submitted this and the peer reviewer wrote back and they weren't, they said the paper wasn't ready. I think we could have got it there. What they did is they wrote back and they said that we've that the paper was intriguing because they've had lots of success penetrating into the soft sciences, the, the social sciences, but they'd have very little success penetrating into the natural sciences, which is what they wanted to achieve. Now we're seeing how they're going to penetrate into the natural sciences. They're just going to kind of force it through sustainable development goals by saying the only way we're going to achieve major, say, geoengineering projects is by getting the hard sciences involved and on board. 2.3, challenges of working together for the sustainable development goals. 2.3.1, research. Although there seems to be wide consensus among HEI faculty members on the imp- HEI is higher education institution, uh, faculty members on the importance of interdisciplinary research and teaching. I don't know if that's even true. I think that they live in a bubble. And I don't know a lot of physicists, except for the kind of soft ones who think that the English department has a damn thing worth saying about what they do. And more institutions for interdisciplinary research and teaching have been established within higher education institutions. Additional efforts are needed to educate graduate students in those, quote, problem areas that attract faculty members across different disciplines. Yeah, they're called commissars. New administrative tools have been provided by government agencies in recent years for enhancing interdisciplinary research and teaching, but there are still serious challenges to interdisciplinary research and teaching on higher education institution campuses. Deep tensions between disciplines with different paradigms. Paradigms is in scare quotes. This is a a subsection. The fact that higher education institutions organize their teaching and research on the basis of, quote, disciplines is a result of the development of sciences as, quote, normal sciences defined by different, quote, paradigms in Thomas Kuhn's 1962 words. Of course, they're invoking Thomas Kuhn. What they're, they're invoking in this case is the structure of Scientific Revolution. I think that's the title of the book. Something like that. So it is only natural for different branches of scientific knowledge to offer different ways of understanding the world, thus making it different for difficult for science, scientists from these different disciplines to communicate with other disciplines, again citing Kuhn. While it is true that major steps in scientific development are marked by, quote, crises and, quote, revolutions in the history of science, characterized by breaking down the borders between different, quote, normal sciences, these, quote, border-breaking events are traditionally considered as achievements to be appreciated rather than goals to be pursued. My God, I could do a two-hour podcast just talking about how these woke idiots misuse, at the best, what Thomas Kuhn was writing. I don't have time to do this here. This is already going to be super long. We don't have time to break down this very common misuse that they have. But let me give you a very quick idea of what they're talking about. A paradigm shift within physics was when we shifted out of the Newtonian frame, for example, into the Einsteinian frame. So we completely shifted our paradigm of how we understand motion to work so that it was now understood to be relative. Relative to what? Relative to the speed of light. 
And so there was this gigantic shift in thought in terms of how Newtonian mechanics works. And this was a paradigm shift. And we think that this was, wow, Einstein's a great genius. He shifted us out of the place where we were stuck in Newtonian science. What he didn't do was come in with criticality. What he didn't do was come in with a political agenda and start trying to shift things around in a Lysenkoist way. What he did do was he said that there's a way of reframing what we're actually doing in physics to understand the physics that we understood before and answer questions that are outside of what we can answer now. So Newtonian physics allows you to answer lots and lots of questions, but it doesn't allow you to answer certain questions. Relativistic physics allows you to answer those questions. Certain things about the intersection of, uh, say, classical mechanics and electricity and magnetism require relativity theory to make sense of them. Um, when we get to general relativity theory, the thing makes GPS be able to work. But that turns uh, the, the influence of gravity on like the speed of time uh, turns out to be important to understand the precession and the perihelion of Mercury, which is that's a that's a separate discussion. Required general relativity to understand how uh, gravity actually works to the point where it can bend light. The, there was a famous solar eclipse in which they were able to see a star that should have been behind the disk of the sun. The only explanation is gravitational lensing that Einstein had predicted, and so his relativity theories got more confirmation. But this isn't the same thing as adding critical theory into anything. This isn't the same as adding a moral dimension. It's saying that there is some important physical truth that hasn't been discerned that reframes how we understand the, the rest of what we're doing in the sciences. It doesn't destroy the other sciences. Newtonian physics isn't wrong. It is a very good approximation that assumes something incorrect. So Newtonian physics isn't wrong. It's a very good approximation. That's a very different thing. But you can't, from within Newtonian physics, understand what the approximation is. You have to step outside of it. So you have to have a paradigm shift. <sighs> this is how they misuse this all the time to basically suggest that you have to bring political agendas into the sciences. The woke do this all the time. They've been doing this since the 90s. It's been criticized, or since before, since the 70s probably. It's been criticized again and again and again and again and again. And they just keep doing it because they literally don't care that they're wrong. They have no interest that they're wrong. There have been books written about this very subject. They just don't care that they're wrong, and they keep invoking it. And so here it is again. They're misusing a topic. And all, this, these are the humanities people, by the way. They're going to step into your sciences and tell, them, tell you you're doing them wrong. The people who can't even understand what in the hell they're talking about. They don't understand how science works, but they're going to they're gonna have power over you. That's what they've already outlined. You have to understand what's happening here. Um, where were we? We were with uh, these border breaking events are traditionally considered as achievements to be appreciated rather than goals to be pursued. In order for researchers and professors in different disciplines to think and work together, they should strive to reach a deeper and broader understanding of the problem they are supposed to address together than could possibly be achieved on the basis of their respective disciplines separately or even jointly. That's the transcending part where you're no longer doing your discipline, you're doing what the, the humanities professor wants you to do. Training and practices. There are challenges that relate to the relationship between how scientists or scholars are trained. Yeah, like can they do math and how they work. On the one hand, how a scientist enjoys their scientific activities depends very much on how they were trained in preparing their scientific career. On the other hand, how future scientists are trained Depends, in, uh, depends on how their teachers mature as scientists conduct, their teachers as mature scientists conduct their research and teaching. In other words, you're going to have to teach to make sure that the activist types stay happy. That's what that's going to boil down to. The excuse is always that the physics department is being taught wrong, it's teaching physics wrong, and that chases women out of physics. So you have to feminize, feministize your department in order to make it more accessible to women. But really, activists is what they want. This is how they get you. They go after the discipline. They say you're teaching it wrong. You're saying that the social environment is bad for certain groups of people who are predominantly going to be activists within the acad academic sectors. And they use it as a lever to get activists placed in these positions who are not necessarily good scientists. People like Chanda Prescott Weinstein, who is apparently not that good of a physicist, but writes lots of papers whining about how physics allows for something called white empiricism, where 
people of color, or especially women of color, are allegedly held to a higher standard than, than, than their white peers, blah, blah, blah. Bullshit. But that's who you're going to end up having in your department if that gobbledygook sentence comes true. Most scientists are used to working within the fields in which they were trained, and their students, in turn, will also be used to, work, used to working within the fields in which their teachers now feel most comfortable working. Seeing that I was trained as a combinatorist, it would be pretty frickin' ballsy if I stepped in and said, guess what, guys, I'm going to be an analyst in your math department. Turns out that it's hard. Turns out each of these things is really hard. It requires a massive amount of study, a massive amount of work. But not in the humanities, where they wouldn't understand this at all. They're literally just making this shit up. How do I know? I made this shit up for a year, year and a half. It was very successful. There's a particular, you see, it says, you know, it says that everybody's going to be comfortable in the field that they're working. I literally made up shit in like 15 different subdisciplines, 15 different ones in a year. I just, we just made up crap, feminist criminology, f feminist social work, feminist philosophy. You know, those are all feminist, but we did race theory. We did queer theory. I mean, we, you just get sexuality studies, fat studies, disability. You can literally just jump around and make stuff up or when you're making stuff up. And I did it. I proved it. That was the Grievance Studies Affair. If you don't know about the Grievance Studies Affair, you're missing out. There's a particular... <laughs> there is a particular role for scholars in the humanities, such as philosophy, history, the arts, and literature in collaborative efforts toward the Sustainable Development Goals. Yeah, because they're commissars. As expertise in these disciplines is especially important in collectively addressing the comprehensive, complex, and in a sense, quote, wicked problems the goals address doesn't say who called them wicked. Motivations and incentives. There are challenges in terms of the relationship between how a higher education institution faculty is motivated to work and how this kind of motivation is nurtured and encouraged by higher education institution leaders. How a university member is motivated depends on the way the academic activities are organized in their institution, and administrators in turn need, to support, need support from faculty members in introducing and implementing new ways of organizing research and teaching. It is not easy for faculty members to support a radically new policy introduced by higher education institution leaders that departs from the mentality that has been nurtured and encouraged in the past. Guess what they're going to be asked to do, though? So they're going to have to create new incentive structures to make sure that everybody's doing the SDG radical transformation thing. Faculty specialization and insecurity, the promotion and tenure process that is historically that, is, that historically favors specialized study, poses a series of hurdles for inter and transdisciplinary approaches. So they're going to want to dissolve or weaken that, or actually they're going to want to expand tenure, which is that nobody can get fired, but they're going to want to expand it to nobody can get fired, and we're doing bullshit. So there will be commissars who are like sustainable officers who can confer tenure outside of any particular department so that the transdisciplinary gurus can get it. Just a guess. There's a series of hurdles for inter- and transdisciplinary approaches as the professional advancement of faculty is tied to specialized and discipline-specific work and individual faculty accomplishments are rewarded ahead of collaborative efforts. So if I wrote a paper, say, as a mathematician in physics, the math department probably doesn't care that much about it, so my career advancement doesn't go anywhere. That's the thing they're trying to complain about. This reinforces silos and precludes interdisciplinary collaboration in research and scholarship. It turns out most of that's not terribly valuable a lot of the time. Sometimes it is, but not very often. But again, there are certain people who are really predisposed to be able to do this, people who think that, you know, they're... They've never taken a math class that they passed in their lives, but they think they have something important to say about physics. The massive restructuring of higher education has led to an increase in part-time faculty or adjunctification. That's true. This is actually a problem. The university business model sucks, whose employment is insecure and under-remunerated, resulting in a revolving door of faculty. Now, this turns out to be a big, big problem in the uh, AHSS, arts, humanities, and social sciences because they don't have other jobs that they can get. They just don't. They can't go work in the private sector. They don't really have any skills. So they have to get university jobs, and there's too damn many of them. So the universities are giving them adjunct positions for really crappy amounts of money. It's really a big problem. It was the overproduction of PhDs 
and in some sense, master's degrees that led to this position to this problem, and now they're leveraging this problem. However, adjunctification has the potential to be positive. For example, it allows faculty in high-income countries to pursue a career in their country and contribute to education on specific topics in low- and middle-income countries. They enjoy that. Higher education institution leadership must advocate for faculty working across the disciplines and better working conditions for those who are employed on a short-term contractual basis. More money for these dorks who shouldn't have had PhDs in the first place. In or Do you know how easy it would be to get a PhD in one of those fields? Oh my god. In order for such advocacy to be effective, it must eventually be institutionalized, centrally endorsed, and formalized in university policy and faculty handbooks, as well as at grassroots levels in the form of college bylaws and or unit-based promotion and tenure documents. In other words, it has to be made official. Framing. There are challenges in terms of the relationship between intellectual activities that are oriented toward what has been referred to as problem solving and those that are oriented toward truth seeking. There's a lot of gray area in problem solving, right? Generally speaking, science and research that follow a logic that is truth oriented are more often motivated by personal curiosity and free thinking, whereas problem oriented research is related to ideals of social responsibility and sponsored inquiry. You thought for a minute it was going to be about engineering, right? You thought, oh, well, problem solving, engineering. No, it's about ideals of social responsibility. Mm -hmm. It is very important to bring together these two types of intellectual activities. So you got to bring the social, social responsibility problem solving, not engineering problem solving, into the truth seeking. You have to bring social responsibility busybodies into the truth seeking natural sciences. That's what they're advocating for with lots and lots of words that never quite say it exactly. It is very important to bring together these two types of intellectual activities so that problem-oriented intellectual activities, remember that means social responsibility, that doesn't, that means commissars, that doesn't mean engineers, means social engineers, not real engineers. Uh, so that problem-oriented intellectual activities can be solidly supported by truth-oriented activities. Get that? so that the activist stuff can be solidly supported by science. And truth-oriented activities can be critically or constructively enhanced by problem-oriented activities. In other words, they can be redesigned. The critical theorists in the feminist English department can come in and redesign glaciology. They can constructively enhance it. The major intellectual and organizational challenge is organizing interdisciplinary research and teaching. Oh, sorry, in organizing interdisciplinary research and teaching is, therefore, how to develop a complementary rather than confrontational relationship between these two types of intellectual activities. What are they? Actually, they are real research and activism, and they don't want confrontation between activism and real research. They want the activism to direct the real research, and they want the real research to support their activism even when it doesn't. That's Lysenkoism, by the way. More importantly, it is crucial to be attentive to the fact that knowledge production and higher education is diverse in its aims and perceived purposes, and that it is important not to be content with neat dichotomies like you can't do math and I can, but rather aim to move beyond such distinctions and compartmentalization. I'm trying to find out what's true and you're fucking around. That's another dichotomy that they want to make sure we don't make so neat higher education institutions in society. There are challenges in terms of the relationship between higher education institutions and society at large in assessing the value of academic work. Yeah, a lot of it's a bunch of shit, and the society at large has figured it out. Almost everything going on in those AHSS fields is bullshit, and we've figured it out. In fact, it's not even just bullshit, it's activist bullshit. The entirety of, humani of the humanities is basically crap now, with the possible exception of certain parts of the classics departments. Everything else is activist shit and has been for a long time. Thank you, Grievance Studies Affair, for showing that. The social sciences. I mean, yeah, some interesting stuff's happening there for sure, but what about that replication crisis? I think that we could probably guess that anywhere upwards of at least 50, but maybe as much as 80% of the stuff that they're doing over there can't be replicated, which means it's probably bullshit. In fact, it just means that it's bullshit. And then there's a massive other crisis that people aren't talking about other than the replication crisis in the social sciences. Well, a couple of them. One of them is the p-hacking crisis, 
Um, that's a, I think that ties into the uh, replication crisis. It's another topic altogether. But then there's the one that is, uh, what is it called? That's exposed by funnel plots, which is is a plot that can be done in a certain type of a meta analysis where you take lots of studies and you look at how they come out. What you're finding is that there's a massive amount of biasing going on. Maybe the studies themselves individually are okay-ish, but there's a massive amount of biasing. So there are certain conclusions that when the papers produce those conclusions through legitimate or illegitimate means, those papers get published, they get promoted, etc. And when they do not reproduce those, those results, they just don't get accepted. This is a completely different kind of bias. This is a rampant problem in the social sciences. So those AHSS, I don't know what the arts are producing. It, it have any value for like say glaciology except I guess feminist glaciers paintings or whatever but the thing is that the the society at large a knows that the humanities departments aren't producing anything that's even similar to what the hard sciences are producing and b that uh the that there's these massive other problems that's kind of coming onto the, the horizon for them, the replication crisis. They don't know about that biasing problem, but they're aware of the bias. Everybody kind of knows that these super left wing departments, and that's well known now, are doing super left wing horseshit. And that's a sort of a super big problem for how society at large assesses the value of academic work, which is poorly. Even within the harder sciences, there's a massive amount of skepticism around climate change research. Why? Because it's got such a huge political implication attached to it. They lied to us so much about so many other things. Why aren't they? Why should we believe they're not lying to us about that? It's really hard. None of us can do the studies. It's really hard to tell. So the society at large thinks the value of academic work is about where it actually belongs because academic work has been corrupted at least since the current model of academic publishing started to skew it, maybe before. And so it's somewhere, you know, like two layers down below the bottom of the muck at the bottom of the toilet. And the society at large is coming to know it. And it's going to be a big problem for these people. It's the corruption, the fraud is becoming obvious. Now let me tell you the quick story about that academic publishing quip that I made. Very interesting little fact. Turns out that there is a character in history. And he realized that, you know, it's possible to make an awful lot of money redirecting how scientific research is published. Because if you control how it's published, then you control how it's going to be done. So you, in a sense, control the sciences one step removed by controlling what can and can't be published. Which you think, oh no, peer reviewers decide what's going to be published. Departments and, and you know, a physics department cares about what physics is being done and they care about what kind of papers are getting written and therefore they direct kind of what's happening. Well, yeah, that's true. But at the end of the day, if the publishing house has some kind of a say in what's going on, which they do through economic means, but not direct academic means, then they can actually kind of have a subtle influence, a wind blowing in education. And it turns out that there was this guy that figured out a few, many years ago in the 60s, I think, figured out how to make a lot of money by changing the academic publishing industry pretty much completely to the model that we have now, which every academic that you ever talk to basically acknowledges is one of the biggest scams in the universe. We could talk about why for a long time, but that's beside the point. It turns out this guy is fairly famous. He's a British guy. He's a fairly famous um, kind of uh, scuzzy guy. Uh, but he has a much more famous daughter uh, who is an interesting character that this happens to come up here. So it turns out that this British guy ends up founding the company that we're talking about. I don't know if he founded it first in London, but it got a major uh, wing in Thousand Oaks, California. The company's called Sage Publishing. It's one of the largest academic publishers in the world. And the guy who founded its name is Robert Maxwell. And he's pretty famous. You can look him up. You can do all kinds of interesting and weird stories about Robert Maxwell. But maybe most interesting is that his daughter is Ghislaine. Ghislaine Maxwell. Yeah, that Ghislaine Maxwell. The one with Jeffrey Epstein. Who said that he has two hobbies, one of which was science. You can look up what the other one was for yourself. Just saying. So, yeah, society at large is having a hard time with accepting the claim to an intrinsic value in a lot of academic work, for a lot of very good reasons, guys. So how higher education institutions and their faculty members, they say, are treated and how their performance and achievements are valued in society at large depends on the prevailing value standards, say at Sage Publishing. But these value standards should be in, should in turn be improved by higher education institutions and the faculty members, especially when higher education has entered the expansion phase. 
in order to establish a virtuous rather than a vicious circle between society at large and higher education institutions in terms of their role in implementing the sustainable development goals, not other stuff like educating kids, young adults, I should say, or providing basic research that the world benefits from in the least biased way that they possibly could do. Mm, no, not that. Collaborative efforts of higher education institutions and promoting the SDGs is what recognition of value that the society at large needs to be involved in. Now, it's really funny because that's literally part of Agenda 2030, which is this huge like thing that sounds like a conspiracy theory to lots of people and is really outside the edge of people's window of trust otherwise. In fact, a lot of the people who trust the United Nations Agenda 2030 think it's a conspiracy theory that Agenda 2030 even exists, even though this document is explicitly about Agenda 2030. And so are many other documents. And it's all over their website. And literally, they have an entire site set up to it. And they talk about it all the time. It's still a conspiracy. The people who trust it think it doesn't exist. That's really hilarious. Ranking and assessment of higher education institutions in general and their individual fields and disciplines in particular, especially those recognized by governmental and non-governmental sponsors, very often function as an incentive for university operations. That means if they re-incentivize how ranking and assessment of higher education institutions and their disciplines and departments is done to favor SDG and Agenda 2030 and activist uh, perspectives or points or agendas, if they realign how we rank and assess universities, departments, and disciplines to be in line with the activism, then that creates a strong incentive for university operations. So they're you know what they're going to do. You can predict the move. They're going to change the ranking mechanisms. They will say this explicitly, by the way, the ranking mechanisms for universities, departments, and disciplines so that the ones that are doing the SDGs are good and everybody else is bad. Not how well are they educating kids, not how well are they doing research. You know, University of Michigan has dumped money after money after money after money at being number one in research and everything, number one in football, number one in everything. For example, that's not going to matter. The new ranking system isn't going to be how many doctors do they produce, how high are their MCAT scores, how many whatever. The new ranking system is going to be how committed to the SDGs they are. And all the universities are going to scramble for the rankings because they're all stupid and they're all corrupt. One telling example of this, they say, comes from China, where in October 2020, top leadership issued a comprehensive policy document for intensifying the reform of educational assessments, covering almost every aspect of government-run formal education. At one point, the document makes explicit reference to the SDGs relating them to educational assessments through the requirement to, quote, actively carry out an international cooperation in education evaluation, participate in the monitoring and evaluation of the implementation of the educational part of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, and thereby to display Chinese concepts and contribute to Chinese solutions. This from Xinhua News Agency 2020. That's a ringing endorsement, UNESCO. Ringing endorsement. The document mentions only assessment of the performance of educators and educational agencies concerning the educational part of the SDGs, but not the role that education in general and higher education in particular plays in promoting the SDGs. See, it does a great job, but it doesn't go far enough. A more comprehensive understanding of the connection between higher education institutions and SDGs is obviously very important. They're going to rank your universities on a very Chinese social credit style system. They're going to rank your universities, your discipline, uh, your department, your individual academic performance in terms of how well you're promoting their Agenda 2030 sustainable development goals, teaching and research. There are challenges in terms, there are always challenges because nobody wants to do this bullshit. There are challenges in terms of the relationship between what is taught and what is researched in higher education institutions. Teaching is typically concerned with widely accepted scientific discoveries, but research in universities is meant to challenge old ideas and explore new ones. This contrast makes it difficult for the latest achievements of established disciplines to be taught in classrooms. It is obviously even more difficult for the latest achievements of interdisciplinary research to be taught in classrooms. See, there's the point. The point wasn't It's hard to bring the research cutting edge into an undergraduate classroom where they can't even understand the basic concepts yet because they haven't learned them. It's that we can't bring our activist dimension into the classroom and hence for students to be well-trained for future 
interdisciplinary, aka activist research. That's what they're said. That's what they've said. That's what their point is. Now, let me give you a quick example from mathematics. Okay. As a mathematics, former mathematics teacher in a university, I can tell you that the vast majority of students in the university in the United States today do not take calculus and could not pass calculus. Okay, so we're talking about the research cutting edge, right? Calculus was invented in the early 1500s. Calculus is over 500 years old. Calculus is 500 year old technology. Your average university student can't do it. Never will do it. Can't even take it. Can't pass the class. How are we supposed to bring the cutting edge of research and mathematics to them? When I was in graduate school, if we learned anything newer than 1950, it was in a super advanced class in almost every case. Turns out that this is sort of how it works. The basics now in most of our disciplines are old. Not in, of course, these inter and transdisciplinary and humanities things where they're literally making it up as they go and everything is less than five years old. But that's their whole purpose. That's their whole purpose. They don't want actual rigorous education. They want to have an excuse to bring their activism into every classroom, every uh, set of curriculum, every discipline. 2.3.2, teaching a curriculum. I know this is a bit dull. The challenges and changes laid out at the beginning of this chapter are reflected in the new course offerings uh, by front-running higher education institutions and in new league tables of higher education institutions. This is citing a ranking page, impact ranking methodology from uh, Times, of higher, Times Higher Education. So I guess that's the Times, like Times London, um, Higher Education, that's T-H-E. It's a huge, huge journalistic publication about in higher ed. And it's the title of the, uh, the, the, the link, and I don't have the title of the article, is Impact Rankings 2020 Methodology. Impact Rankings, just like impact investments. Some higher education institutions have begun emphasizing in their advertisements that their new education course offerings and their learning experiences are interdisciplinary and holistic. There's your Hegel and whatnot. Preparing students for the new normal post-COVID-19 world, the new normal, after the Great Reset includes nurturing skills and mental capacity for active learning, curiosity, and mental stress tolerance. Turns out that's very convenient for also achieving the SDGs. And as another UNESCO document I recently read into a podcast tells us, and the reason it's very useful for overcoming the SDGs is because it, 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 you can use these techniques to overcome the cognitive dissonance of being forced to become an activist in a self-contradictory program as well as being able to synthesize broad knowledge, that means bring in critical theory, and co-create sustainability solutions. That means some communist bullshit. Yet sustainability is, that's in quotes, yet quote sustainability is still not thoroughly implemented in the strategic plans of many higher ins education institutions. Tut, 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 tut. You're not doing enough for the sustainability bullshit. Even among those that self-report in order to be measured on their sustainability performance on the AASHE index, what in the world does that stand for? I don't know. AASHE index. Only two thirds have earned platinum, gold, or silver. Sorry, only two thirds have earned platinum, gold, silver, or bronze stars. Stars is in all caps, which means it's an acronym, which means it's some communist bullshit. Why is this so? What needs to be done to overcome the obstacle? Sorry, it's a question. What needs to be done to overcome the obstacles to progress on the needed transformation of higher education institutions? Now, notice that they just say that transforming higher education institutions to do the SDGs is needed. That's hidden as, a, as an assumption in the question. In, in the old uh, days, we would call that begging the question. That doesn't, begging the question isn't the way most people use it. It doesn't mean, oh, this circumstance raises the need to ask a question. That's not begging the question. It doesn't beg us to ask a question. That's not what it means. Begging the question means you've tucked an assumption in somewhere that's not justified anywhere. You're just saying an assumption. That begs the question. I think the question is, the fuck are you talking about? Based on what? It's circular reasoning is what it really is. The growth imperative. One potential er answer lies in the fact that most of the countries in the world have placed economic growth as the primary policy goal during the past decades. Uh-oh. 
the country or community's social, environmental, and sustainability dimensions have been systematically relegated. Moreover, job opportunities and wealth accumulation have become the priorities of most students and their families. Taking the cue, see you have the wrong values. You actually want to be successful, have a good job, and maybe make a little money and have a comfortable life and maybe improvement for your children. That is the wrong priority. You should be prioritizing sustainability and having less. You can own nothing and be happy. Just think about it. Taking the cue from stakeholders, higher, edu higher education institutions aligned degree programs and course offers offerings more closely with perceived job opportunities and economic opportunities. That turns out not even to be true, by the way. There's a massive problem in, in universities where they actually prioritized what they could rope kids into dreaming and becoming and sticking in college to do to get a degree that's going to get them a job that there is no job for, like, say, getting a PhD in the humanities. Or there was a huge expose, actually, in NPR uh, 10 years ago or thereabouts, maybe longer that I heard, I brought it up many times, where they said that the universities were producing 11 veterinarians who are in massive student debt, vet schools extremely expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, often three, four, five hundred thousand dollars of student loan debt. They're producing 11 veterinarians for every one that the market could absorb. And that's a big problem. So this isn't even true. They weren't actually aligning degree programs and course offers, offerings more closely with perceived job opportunities and economic opportunities. They were actually aligning them with perceived ability to keep students paying a lot of money into the institutions, thus producing lots of educated people who have lots of debt, who can't get jobs, who become discontented, and then agitate for things like student loan uh, bailouts, uh, socialist policy. As it turns out, this story isn't true turns out they're blaming capitalism for something that's not even what happened that was actually uh, a lever used to create socialist policy. What a big shock. But people will just swallow this because it sounds kind of real. Industry relevance is given the strongest emphasis. No, student retention is and has been for over 15 years. Faculty members were recruited and incentivized accordingly. Mm, not so sure. Hence, most faculty members do not have a strong foundation in or knowledge of sustainability principles or solutions. I bet uh, I don't even want to comment on that. Moreover, they are given few or no opportunities by respective higher education institutions and national funding agencies who have prioritized narrowly focused economic growth objectives and goals. None of this is true, but they're still using it because it seems plausible and evil capitalistic y. They're still using it to leverage to get more people who are focused on SDGs as professors and students, I suppose. Besides, the HEIs, the higher education institutions, have grown in scale and a broad range of course offerings has emerged due to the push for mass higher education worldwide, you know, like diversity classes. Leaders of higher education institutions have reinforced rigid disciplinary boundaries for ease of management, cost controls, and differentiated course fees. Yeah, but also, maybe that's true, but also... They're not doing it as an explicit conspiracy to keep activists out in your bullshit transdisciplinarity stuff that you made up in the past 10 years. It's probably literally that they're bending over backwards for you and you're going to leverage that anyway, but that there's just institutional momentum because things are hard to change when you have a gigantic institution. Over the decades, these discipline-based frameworks and approaches to managing academic units have fed themselves, have fed on themselves, sorry, and led to self-serving subcultures and academic processes. Sounds really critical theory-ish to me. Sustainability as peripheral to core business. Yeah, because it's bullshit, but okay. There are a number of other reasons for inertia or inaction by higher education institutions. You see, this is a leverage. We're leveraging you people who we can we can manipulate section of the document. One prevailing view is that sustainability and the sustainable development goals are not the core business of higher education institutions. Pause. Because they're not but an agenda for governments, businesses, and consumers. They're not that either. They're an agenda 2030 put forth by the Fourth International over there in the United Nations. And if you don't know what the Fourth International is, the Third International meant the Third International of the Communist Party, which was headquartered in Moscow until the USSR collapsed. HEIs around the world find it hard to pre precisely define curricula, especially when there is pressure for them to be framed in terms of potential future job opportunities. This is such bullshit. There's so many job opportunities in this horseshit sustainable development uh, sector that this is complete bullshit. 
Moreover, the multiple articulations of sustainability thus far are often perceived as broad vision statements and goals that lack sufficient detail. That's because that's all there is for building or repositioning the respective curricula of academic programs and organizational units. See, they just make these broad mission statements like we're going to brainwash the students into having a culture rather than also actively revamping course offerings and curriculum and programs to produce activists faster and thus hire the people that wrote shit like this. There are also general inertia uh, there is also general inertia around making changes before clarity exists about the scale of jobs available for all the sustainability focused graduates. Diversity of higher education institutions. This is a boring section. HEIs are diverse in terms of comprehensiveness, resources, talent, scale, and mandate. Some HEIs are highly specialized, whereas others are more comprehensive in terms of their range of disciplines. Impactful sustainability education demands interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary treatment of subjects and projects. More officers, more political officers, more commissars. Thus compromising the ability of narrowly, defi- narrowly focused higher education institutions to deliver on such requirements. So if you're a technical school that focuses on STEM, you can't do as well because you don't have enough uh, humanities people to come in and, and monkey you around. Some institutions are focused primarily on undergraduate education with limited involvement in graduate education and scientific research. They are less equipped than research-intensive universities or postgraduate universities that are able to integrate cutting-edge knowledge into their sustainability education programs and learning experiences. Isn't it just horrible? According to the World Higher Education Database, of the 20,000 higher education institutions worldwide, only a small fraction have adequate resources to adapt their academic programs and infrastructure to the deeper aspects of sustainability education, research, and solutions. In other words, a majority of the higher education institutions are unable to match the requirements of sustainability's vision and goals with adequate talent or ex- and expertise. In other words, you need to rede- redevote resources. We need to reprioritize, put resources into hiring or redirecting resources into uh, getting more sustainability uh, talent and expertise more commissars and more bullshit professors with bullshit degrees and bullshit made up stuff that they bullshit made up in the past five to ten bullshit years. The inertia of higher education institution structures. In general, curriculum changes in higher education institutions are often associated with cumbersome and lengthy approval processes. You can't change fast enough. We have to put a, or they're going to have to get a Soviet in charge that can change them as quick as they need to. Academic units, departments and, facu- departments and faculty, schools and colleges are resourced and incentivized based on student numbers and their full-time equivalents. In other words, research or sorry, leaders of each academic unit fight very hard to retain and grow full-time equivalents. That means students who are full-time or full-time equivalent. This means less attention is given to subjects taught by faculty members from other academic units or to co-teaching by them. They're just trying to weasel into everything, guys. You can have a feminist come co-teach your glaciology class or your physics class. Why not? Why not? The rigid academic units and disciplinary structures of higher education institutions can cause resistance to change. That's why you need a Soviet. This is going to tell them what to do, and everybody's going to have to do it. Whatever you do, you're going to have to do what they said. In the case of affiliated higher education institutions, it's even harder for them to make any changes to their curriculum, pedagogy, and student assessment systems. In the case of professional degrees, got to scroll. Oh, crap. Something. (laughs) I got to scroll back. Any changes to the curriculum and degree programs have to be reviewed and endorsed by the professional accreditation bodies and societies, which tend to be national as well as international. These accreditation exercises are scheduled at intervals of three to five years, thus imposing limitations on the speed of changes the higher education institutions might like to make. Wouldn't it be useful if they installed, say, a council, a Soviet that could, could just bring this from the top down very quickly? Uh huh. Professional bodies have diverse standards and criteria. Not if you get them all on the same page, so those have to be attacked. In other words, the higher education institution faculty members and academic leaders have to educate them and persuade them of the need for changes and the usefulness of educational outcomes in terms of graduates' futures. So you're going to have to get brainwashed into sustainable development or let arm, you know, your arm twisted into pushing SDGs. And then you are also going to have to go tell, say, if you're a doctor, the American Medical Association, if you're a physicist, the the, uh, American Physical Union, if you're 
uh, a mathematician, the American Mathematical Society or the uh, Mathematics Association of America, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to have to go tell them how important it is that the professional society immediately push everything as fast and hard as possible to endorse um, sustainable development. You're also going to have to pressure your colleges and your deans and your department heads to make sure that any policy changes that are focused in the right direction, especially the hiring of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary activists, is going to be something that they do right away. And ideally, all of these kind of professional bodies and these uh, accreditation things can be streamlined under the, the the influence of a single Soviet that will move it, council, I'm sorry, I said it in Russian, that will move everything uh, into the thing very quickly, into into that direction very quickly. Crowded curriculum, because see, universities are too cumbersome to change fast enough to become to become political outposts of the new world order. So we have to change how that's all done. That's that's what that's about. Crowded curriculum, stricter. So guess what's going to have to happen? Your course offerings are going to have to get dropped so that you can make room for sustainability classes, just like they had to make room for diversity classes and shit like that. Stricter requirements in core disciplines often do not allow for substantial changes in curriculum. The existing curriculum is often crowded with different subjects, modules, or courses offered by individual academic units. An even more challenging hurdle is the lack of an institutionalized incentive system for implementing changes and transitioning into new areas. In the case of research-oriented universities, faculty members tend to teach subjects close to their own research areas. Yeah, because that's how that works. Annual assessments, promotion and tenure processes, and award and reward selection processes favor and mostly encourage narrowly focused monodisciplinary work by the individual faculty member. I can speak as a combinatorist that even teaching abstract algebra would have been a difficult thing, uh, anything beyond like the junior undergraduate level, even though I was quite good in abstract algebra. Um, yeah, that's a thing. This causes a systemic inbuilt inertia that keeps faculty members from transitioning to interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary pursuits. Remember, those are code words for activist pursuits. Many higher education institutions suffer from excessive governance and bureaucratic layers in the name of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, SWOT, SWOT analysis, risk assessments, and mitigation measures. In some cases, academic leaders are chosen or appointed for fixed or limited terms, and thus they are less incentivized to radically change or upset the status quo. So blatant. This situation contributes to a risk-averse culture on the part of all HEI stakeholders and can result in students being discouraged from pursuing transdisciplinary degree programs and subjects, activist ones, that is, and or bullshit ones, or both, usually both. And so we're going to have to figure out ways to change the way that curriculum can be changed so that some, everybody doesn't have to take some stupid shit like American history that nobody needs to know anything about or learning to read like any or write or whatever, you know, your literature, your writing core curriculum classes. And we can have diversity classes and sustainability classes. And maybe you don't have to really have your basic engineering coursework. Like that's not really as necessary. We can cut back on a couple basic engineering courses before you get into the more advanced engineering courses and work in some sustainable engineering courses. You can get rid of some of those higher end specialty classes like dynamics um, and replace them with sustainability for engineering on an advanced level. You know, the senior project class can be a sustainable development project, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem is that the universities aren't, desi aren't designed to change quickly in that regard. Training for teachers. This is a surprisingly long section. Um, and this, this, this is a whole page dedicated to this. Uh, because what, what do they, they want? They want more brainwashing. So if you're a college educator, they want you to be brainwashed into doing this. But they say that right now, we don't have the resources to make it happen. Most higher education institutions around the world do not have adequate tra training methods to introduce and empower faculty members with improved pedagogical methods and teaching tools, like, say, probably critical pedagogy and social-emotional learning. They need further training. You need more training. I told you earlier you're going to need more training. And new methods of student engagement to embark on and appreciate collaborative teaching with experts from other disciplines and delivering sustainability and SDG-related education and learning. That's what you're going to have to do. This is accentuated by the lack or short supply of quality-relevant teaching textbooks related to sustainability, which is often, you're not going to learn to teach math in the math department, math professors. You're going to have to teach sustainability because you're going to have to get some teaching textbooks for sustainability, which is often viewed as a very broad-based with no core set of principles that can be imparted to the students. 
more of our faculty members themselves need resources, content, time, and re- retraining opportunities in re-education to teach and keep up to date with state-of-the-art as well as emerging sustainability-related knowledge and skills. See, it changes every couple of years because it's bullshit and it's really a power grab. Often, they themselves need to develop the skills, talent, and motivation. How much of this sustainability stuff, how much of the social justice stuff have you heard about five years ago? None of it. None of it. Five years from now, do you think it's going to be the same? Look forward to 2027. Think back to uh, 2017. Think about what what life was like in 2017. Think about what it's like now. Project to 2027. You're going to have to train and retrain and retrain and retrain into whatever the new thing is that they're pushing. This this year, it's diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next year, sustainable development goals. The year after that, it's compliance and risk or some bull crap. Get used to it. If you don't fight, this is the world you're going into. Often, they themselves need to develop, that's you, educators, they themselves need to develop the skills, talent, and motivation to engage in work with and beyond higher education institution agents such as society, community organizations, policymakers, businesses, and industry required by the nature of sustainability education, research, and service. You didn't have enough to do. There's your new, your new list, 30 hours a week. Find time. Don't drop, any, don't drop any of the plates you're spending. Find time. Such processes are time-consuming and require faculty members to work outside of the... See, they're time-consuming, 30 hours a week and require faculty members to work outside of the traditional comfort zones of their respective academic units. See, it's you that's the problem. You have to work You work in your comfort zone. You don't go outside of your comfort zone enough. You're going to have to be incentivized and pushed out. Part of the solution is the priority accorded to sustainability by higher education institution leaders. See, if your deans and your provosts and your presidents push you really hard in that direction, make your life miserable, your department heads, if you don't do it, then we could get around that problem. If they hold sustainability in high regard, then the rank and file will follow suit and make things happen. Whatever the commissar says, comrade. Embracing the unknown or undefined is structurally hard for higher education institution leaders and academics due to governance systems that are not aligned with the particular needs of each institution, especially when it comes to establishing modes of teaching the knowledge and skills necessary for productively working together across disciplines and academic boundaries. Different higher education institution ecosystems or contexts require diverse, customized approaches to sustainability education and also to pedagogy. It's all going to be to sustainability, guys, I'm telling you. Moreover, deeper collaboration and partnerships among the nation's academic, civil civil society, and economic sectors are needed for progress towards sustainability education and the generation of and implementation of solutions. This is elaborated in further detail. Uh, in chapter four of this report, which I don't think I'm going to bother reading for you. Academic leaders need to focus on designing and developing new and creative sustainability education programs that are fundamentally and radically different from the currently established practices. That won't take up too much extra of your time, by the way. This requires deeper and stronger collaboration among faculty members from diverse disciplines. There's, I'm telling you, you're in a science and you're going to have to listen to the fucking humanities weirdos. And the queer theorists are going to tell you how to do chemistry. I'm Queer chemistry, it's a thing. It's already a thing. This requires deeper and stronger collaboration among faculty members from diverse disciplines and with a diverse expertise. Higher education edu- institution leaders need to rethink and create inspiring collaborative spaces in which teams can come together and gel with new ideas for sustainability learning and research. This should scare the crap out of you. I was an academic. I know this should scare the crap out of you. But I was an academic. I know. It won't. You'll think, no, those are big words. It's great. Sustainability challenges are real. And there's a global shortage of suitably trained talent around the world. Higher education needs to be reimagined or redesigned with sustainability in mind. That's a strange death for the university. That's all I'm saying. Fortunately, there is a growing number of online courses which all higher education institutions around the world can leverage as they build their own ecosystems. I'm sure like the World Economic Forum and the UN are putting out bullshit courses that you can outsource to make this impossible time demand they're putting on you easier to manage. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a sustainability requirement for our basic statistics class. It's housed on the UNESCO website. Why don't you just go do that? All right. And if you don't, that's going to count for a third or a quarter of your grade because somebody told me that's what it has to be. The department had decided across all intro statistics classes that the UNESCO module on sustainability and, you know, statistical 
analysis of sustainable blah 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 is a quarter of your grade everybody has to go do it this is going to be you know we're going to set aside some time in class so you don't get overwhelmed with that's going to be part of what we're going to do maybe we'll just take out things like standard deviation which are hard math is hard we're not going to make you calculate things like standard deviations anymore or understand them so that you have time to do your sustainability blah 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 you can leverage them as you build your own ecosystem it is time for higher education institutions to make sustainability and sustainable development goal literacy a core requisite for all faculty members and students. Let me read that sentence to you again, because that is a command. It is time. I wish it said it is high time. It is time for the higher education institutions to make sustainability and sustainable development goal literacy a core requisite for all all faculty members and students. That's the agenda. That's the death of the university. Sustainability education at its core exposes students to real-world problems and immersive learning. We're back to the sales pitch. They've now given the directive. We're back to the sales pitch. Real-world problems and immersive learning and research experiences, appreciating the greater good of people and planet, just like Mark said, and contributing to values beyond mere monetary gain, just like Mark said will further enthuse and inspire students as well as faculty mentors. See, you're going to like it. Ultimately, these, the education culture at the higher education institutions needs to change so that it encourages students to learn via experimentation and critical thinking from multiple perspectives. That's critical theory and the humanities department. That means feminist glaciology in your science class. Higher education institutions need to increase efforts to encourage young minds to take up sustainability education and careers and to continue to effectively communicate the immense benefits of sustainability in terms of economic growth, human well-being, and a healthy planet Earth. The economic growth thing's kind of fallen the hell apart, isn't it? And I don't know how human well-being is doing when people are starving and rioting, because it turns out this whole thing was a giant scam. Uh-oh. How's a healthy planet Earth doing? Well, isn't Germany burning like 800 million masks or something like that? I mean, how many billions of them are floating in the ocean? We're doing great, guys. We're doing great. How much environmental degradation and destruction does it, does it take to build the batteries for your electric cars or your electric banks in your houses? How much does it cost to get all the minerals for the Solar panels, aren't they toxic? Don't they leach those materials into the ground? Can they be recycled? Ooh, no, they can't be recycled. Mm. Maybe this is all a big fucking scam, and they're going to force you to push the scam as hard as you can. It is a requisite. It is a requisite. Remember, let me read the sentence again. I got to scroll back up to it. Because the sales pitch, where was that? We're in the sales pitch, sorry. Higher education needs to be reimagined, redesigned with sustainability in, in mind. That wasn't it. Uh, Core found it. It is time for the higher education institutions to make sustainability and sustainable development goal literacy a core requisite for all faculty members and students. Embracing sustainability is about enabling graduates to be future ready and giving them a deeper sense of contemporary challenges in their future lives. Progressive and timely efforts by all higher education stakeholders can help to promote the well-being of graduates as well as planet Earth. While the challenges are complex and interrelated, there are ways forward to address them as discussed in the following section. I can't believe that we still have to do this, but 2.4 ways forward. Despite the challenges outlined above, there are opportunities for higher education institutions to move forward productively in their contributions to achieving the sustainable development goals. There's no single route for all higher education institutions here. The pathways to be taken will depend on the starting position of the higher education institution and their role in a remit in given contexts. Nonetheless, all pathways will involve developing the means to build on and promote knowledge that comprises a diverse range of traditions, like feminist glaciology, institutions, and epistemologies to promote a truly global knowledge base for the sustainable development goals. By the way, this is exactly what the feminist glaciology paper was about, because it's feminist glaciology, so you would be not at all surprised to find out that it's got a bunch of stuff about how glaciology also has to incorporate not just feminist art projects, but indigenous myths. See, that's a, that's a diverse range of traditions, institutions, and epistemologies 
in order to promote sustainability with regard to climate change and glaciers, which is literally the point of the paper. Similarly, there are general principles around the public value of science and open science that will support global progression in relation to the 2030 agenda. In addition, the global COVID-19 pandemic, what would this be without invoking that again, for all its devastation, presents a partially open but rapidly closing window of opportunity for catalyzing change in relation to sustainability, citing United Nations 2020. That's what Klaus Schwab says about it. A partially open but rapidly closing window of opportunity, COVID-19, on all of its devastation. For what? For catalyzing change in relation to sustainability. The pandemic has crystallized both the challenges and benefits of working together for a safe and sustainable world. It has created a new appetite for collaborative activities eh, against the regime, with the crisis making sustainability, or more commonly, unsustainability, more obvious to people in their day-to-day lives. Yeah, the unsustainability of their crackpot scams. Do we really want the world, like, Do we want the next crisis run by the same idiots that ran the COVID-19 crisis? No, we don't. It's very obvious in our day-to-day lives. We don't want these people in charge of shit anymore, including remaking our universities for sustainable development. This section examines some of the opportunities that exist for higher education institutions to make the sustainable development goals and the 2030 agenda central to their operations and actions and bridge silos within and between research and teaching and research-led teaching, and for the HEIs to productively use their status as a substantial institutional actor within societies. In other words, you're going to burn through your social capital, burn through your cultural capital universities in order to promote an activist agenda. You're going to be a laughingstock. You're going to be a joke. Harvard University is already a joke. You're all going to be a joke. It's all going to be a joke. Universities are going to be this stupid thing that nobody respects because These idiots are going to leverage you and force you to burn up all your cultural capital in pursuit of their agenda. That's all communists do. They seize reservoirs of capital, burn that capital down, pushing their agendas in an illegitimate way every single time. This section... Wait, we already did that part. Uh, Where was I? Okay. Institutional actor within societies that illustrates these opportunities with case studies from diverse contexts. I think this is something I'm going to skip a lot of. Opportunities exist for the higher education institutions to develop and promote knowledge and practice that comprises equitable and collaborative activities from a diverse range of traditions, institutions, and epistemologies. That means ways of knowing, other ways of knowing, in order to build a truly global knowledge base for the sustainable development goals, as there can be considerable inertial, inertia inherent in higher education institution structures, particularly those with long histories. Oh my god, I scrolled all over the place. Where was I? Oh no and established positions within educational infrastructures, this may require the development of explicit intellectual frameworks for collaborative research and practice and deliberative, sorry, deliberate interventions to support the kinds of radical interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity needed to meet the complex challenges of sustainability. That has a box too. I don't know if we're going to read that one. I'm telling you, they're going to transform every single discipline by bringing humanities people in in charge of it. Uh, Box 2 is Intellectual Frameworks for Collaborative Research, Federal University of ABC. No, these are case studies. We're going to skip all of those because there's a lot of them and no. Incentives and support for research need to be reoriented to encourage researchers to engage in equitable and collaborative SDG-related research. Did you hear that? That's what your research is going to be about. It's going to be equitable and collaborative SDG-related research. All of the incentives and support for research need to be reoriented to encourage researchers to engage in equitable and collaborative, sustainable development goal-related research. This can range from systemic measures to improve literacy around the SDGs throughout higher education institutions to specific training for collaborative research across the academic lifetime. Allied to developing intellectual frameworks for collaborative research, indicators and performance assessments need to be recalibrated with collaborative research in mind. We already talked about what that means. And data collection systems need to be deployed or upgraded in order to account correctly for the impact such research creates. Externally driven ranking systems of higher education institutions, for example, should be revised in order not to penalize collaborative researchers or government agencies that can play a key role in developing and implementing specific policies for higher education institutions to promote collaborative research for the sustainable development goals. 
New levels of integration are required between those collaborating from science, technology, and engineering disciplines through to the arts, humanities, and social sciences. I keep telling you. Skilled integrators will be required with specific integration competencies that are as yet underdeveloped and poorly rewarded in many higher education institution settings. Skilled integrators, those are going to be sustainable development officers, interdisciplinarity officers, transdisciplinarity officers. They're going to be bureaucrats. We're going to make sure that this is what's going on. Higher education institutions supported by funding agencies and others need to invest in this integration space. You need to hire these people and give them generous salaries and great benefits packages. Leal Filo et al. 2020 proposed that to extend integration capacity, some universities use their potential to create living labs for the sustainable development goals where such integration can take place within a protected setting. In addition to the capacity to engage in integrative research for the sustainable development goals and to provide investment in protected niches for emergent activities, it is clear that leadership in relation to collaborative working at all levels will be essential. I'm telling you, they're going to hire political officers for this, irrespective of the different ways in which universities might work toward delivering the sustainable development goals. Similarly, some people drawing on their analysis, Blasco et al., 2021, drawing on their analysis of Spanish public universities, conclude that embracing structural and cultural changes which place the sustainable development goals at the core of governance and management of the university is a crucial means for increasing the impact and success of activities. You can hear the direction for yourself. You can tell what they're doing. Now here, one, two case studies. Higher education institutions need to incorporate collaborative working towards sustainable development goals as part of their teaching programs, in a manner that goes beyond creating mere add-ons to their existing discipline-based curricula. Instead, higher education institutions should seek to highlight and enhance the articulation between the curriculum and the latent social and environmental issues of our time, both locally and globally, to give students the opportunity of becoming global citizens, of becoming global citizens, will be able to contribute productively to the construction of new realities, starting from knowledge, skills, and attitudes. There's two case studies attached to that. Let me just put a pause here. There's no such thing as a global citizen. Let me say it again. There's no such thing as a global citizen. Citizenship is a relationship between an individual and his government. You cannot have a global citizen without a global government. We don't have a global government. We don't want a global government. We shouldn't want a global government. We shouldn't get a global government. There's no such thing as a global citizen. There's no global entity than which the individual has a relationship where rights and duties and expectations are uh, kind of codified. No such thing exists. There's no such thing as a global citizen. You are not going to allow students to become global citizens until there is a global government. This is a fraud. This is a trick. It's a language game to make you think, oh, no, it just means being, you know, comfortable moving in and around the world and thinking of yourselves in a more global context, not just an American, but a citizen of the world. You're not a citizen of the world. You're not a global citizen. There is no global government. It doesn't exist. It's a fraud. They want you to think that you're a global citizen so that they can then say, well, you already think of yourself as a global citizen. Let's make good on that by extending you rights and privileges and requiring of you certain duties like achieving the sustainable development goals and all that you do and meeting ESG criteria standards and your personal credit scores by, insta by establishing a global government. You must understand this. This is so important. There is no such thing as a global citizen, but pushing global citizenship as a concept into education is a core objective that they have. There's also a need to increase student voices to achieve transformative approaches. No, no, we've done way too much of that, and the universities are completely fucked up now. Students are, after all, central parts of the educational process, not merely passive recipients. That's Freire's idea. And that's how they got you. No, no more of this. This is how you've, this is how you've screwed yourselves up. But they're going to demand more of it. They think they can radicalize the students in grade school using social-emotional learning and in high school, send them off to the universities as activists who are going to demand the universities do something different, and then universities are going to bend straight over and, with or without lubrication, change everything. 
Higher education institutions, besides their function as producers of new knowledge, teaching, and community engagement, also play an important and relevant role in engaging with society to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. To highlight this function, Purcell et al. 2019 describe universities as engines of transformational sustainability. Describe universities as engines of transformational sustainability toward the Sustainable Development Goals. Hi. What do you think a university is? Hmm, I think it's a place where people go to learn things, and maybe there's some research, and there's professors, and they live there, and they transition from 18 to 22 or so, and they grow up, and they start to become emerging adults in a highly immersive educational environment. No. Engines of transformable, transformational, sorry, engines of transformational sustainability towards the sustainable development goals. There's your definition of a university going forward, thanks to some guy in 2019, who I don't think we voted for, who apparently that's what we have to do, because he said it. That's it. That's it. The aim of higher education, therefore, must be not only teaching textbook knowledge, but, quote, providing future graduates with the necessary competencies to initiate the change toward a more sustainable society. The aim of higher education, therefore, must be making people into competent activists for change toward a more sustainable society. Exactly what they said. Here's a Tsinghua University supports its SDG-focused global strategy with its uh, interdisciplinary-oriented reform program. So another Chinese university is a case study. Good for them. Great. I don't know if they noticed that that place is communist, but I did. Actually, as it turns out, that ends this chapter. Thank God. The next chapter is about diverse ways of knowing. It's just titled Ways of Knowing. We'll come back to that next time. But let me just kind of summarize briefly here. Again, we're, we're, we're doing The Strange Death of the University as a series here. And this particular chapter in The Strange Death of the University describes destroying the disciplinary nature of the universities destroying disciplinary boundaries for the specific purpose of reforming the university as a think tank, an activist training center, and community activist hub for achieving the sustainable development goals of Agenda 2030 of the United Nations. That's a strange death for the university to die, and the strange way is that they're enthusiastic, and think of this as jumping off of a cliff, and they're like, oh boy, a cliff to jump off. The goal here is nothing short of not only repurposing every university to achieve the sustainable development goals of the United Nations Agenda 2030, which again, the only people on earth who trust this are either the, there are two groups of people on earth who trust this. The only people on earth who trust United Nations Agenda 2030, there are only two. Are you ready? A, the people pushing it who I'm going to go ahead and say, are the only ones who are going to benefit from it. And B, the other group, the only other group. So other than the people pushing it, there's only one group of people who trust Agenda 2030. And they're the ones who think it's a conspiracy theory that doesn't exist. That's something you should be thinking about. So in this episode, what we heard is that not only, though, will the universities have to be transformed, part of how they're going to have to be transformed is so that disciplinary boundaries are dissolved. Disciplinary boundaries are removed. As a matter of fact, people from the arts, the humanities, and the social sciences are going to have to move into the natural sciences, and the people in the natural sciences are going to have to set aside their ways of knowing what they do, their sense of superiority, their power and privilege, to listen to the activists coming from these other disciplines who are creating new transdisciplinary approaches which are going to take what you already do and combine it with their activist bullshit and lift it up to a higher level that transcends the existing discipline. Physics will transcend physics and become sustainability physics. Chemistry will transcend chemistry and become sustainability chemistry, which includes queer chemistry. By the way, look that up. I'm not making that up. Biology will transcend biology and become sustainability biology. Medicine will transcend medicine, which is going to kill millions of people, and become sustainability medicine. And on and on it goes. Sustainability medicine will achieve lots of equity, but since equity equalizes downward, again, it will create what I call medical lysenkoism and have referred to many times in the past, and it will kill millions of people. 
millions, millions more. I actually anticipate that if it's not checked and checked soon, medical lysenkoism will in the coming three decades kill billions of people with a B and an S. Billions of people. But that's a transcended form of medicine. It's not medicine stuck in its own ways of knowing. It will have a broader knowledge base, more diversity, blah, 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 all these seemingly good things. And it will be much more sustainable because the people in charge will be able to keep their jobs because the way that you keep your job is not by doing things correctly and offering good patient care and helping people, but by being compliant to the ideology, which will be sustainable because nobody will be allowed to challenge it or else you'll get some special medical attention or something. I'm just kidding. Maybe not. Okay. This is the strange death of the university. This is the destruction of our um, ability to function in knowledge generation and teaching, which are the real actual missions of the university. If you recall, the goal is going to be to rewrite the mission statements of the university, but they're very, very clear. The aim of, just to reread a couple of pages, uh, universities are described as engines of transformational sustainability toward the sustainable development goals. The aim of higher education, your mission statement, must th therefore must be not only teaching textbook knowledge, but providing future graduates with the necessary competencies to initiate change to be activists toward a more sustainable society in line with those SDGs. I want to read that one just punch in the gut sentence again, if I could find it quickly enough. Um, that was in the previous section. So it was the first sentence. It is time. We'll close with a repetition of this. It is time. This is what you're up against. It is time for the higher education institutions to make sustainability and sustainable development goal literacy a core requisite for all faculty members and students. The university is at its end. It doesn't have to be, but I don't know if it has what it takes to fight back and to stop this. People in the universities need to recognize what they're looking at. Your discipline will not be your discipline. Your friend in the chemistry department's discipline will not be his discipline. They will all be brought under an activist agenda. They will all be bound together and oriented toward a new star, not the North Star of Truth, but the criticality false star, I guess, of, of uh, problem solving, which is social and environmental responsibility under the Sustainable Development Goals. I again, I implore you, resist. Resist. If you were waiting for the moment where you're like, oh shit, this is the last hill. This is where we need to die. You're looking at it. Higher education institutions being retooled for the Sustainable Development Goals at every level, teaching, research, committees what's going to be demanded of you this is your this is your hill this is your hill get on it fight